we're going to have a very, very important class where we're going to address a few things. First of all, just a little bit of uh, what's going on around in the world. Uh, what's going on in the world, you know, I don't need to tell you. I uh, try to find the messages of Hashem in every encounter that we have, because that's really why Hashem does everything. Besides that, tomorrow is the fast of Yudzain Betamuz. We're going to address that too. Uh, and a few other things. Uh, if you weren't disappointed last time, then sit through this class. If you were, can't uh, satisfy everybody. Uh, I'm not going to even try to apologize and say, we'll try to do it a short class. Because somehow when I say I'll do a short class, it ends up three hours. So how about I'll do a long class? Maybe it will end up being a short class. <laughs> tov, 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 tov. There is a verse in Shira Shirim, specifically in chapter 4, verse uh, Tetzayin 16, that says, Uri Tzafon, Uvoi Teman. That's part of the verse. The translation, if you are curious, is awake, O north wind, and come, O south wind. I'm sure you heard me not once and not twice say that the translations are worthless. O south thing. It says, Uri Tzafon, okay, fine, I'll accept the O north come. But it's not O north come. Uri means wake up. I don't know what the translation, but more than that, it says, Uvoi Teiman. Voi means come, and Teiman is Yemen. Yemen. So yes, Yemen uh, uh, shot a few missiles at us. So a few days ago, you know, Motzei Shabbat, it was the Ilula of the Orach Haim HaKadosh. They said we need to light a candle for Orach Haim, so they lit up Yemen. <laughs> so one normal move from the Israeli government. If I was in office, I mean, wouldn't be, nothing would be remembered there. But that's a different thing. I don't know if it's good to put me in office. But uh, now that Biden is out, maybe I'll run. <laughs> but nevertheless, uh, oh, speaking of Biden, we'll address that too. How come uh, Mr. Trump is a, is, a hit, is, a, is a target to be assassinated? We'll talk about that too. So we're going to have an interesting class, stay tuned, no point of uh, uh, smearing too much. But let's go back to the verse, Uri Tzafon Uvoi Teman. Uri Tzafon basically says, in simple words, wake up. Uri means wake up. Tzafon is north, Uvoi Teman, again, we'll address this soon. But I'm just finding it very interesting that Teman, Teman is Yemen. Uh, that's, you know, up until a few months ago, most people didn't even hear about the Chutim. Let them, more to know that they're our enemy. So, what's interesting here is that a verse prior to this verse in Shira Shirim, it's a very dear verse to me because that's how I named my, uh, my Torah organization, my Yan Ganim. So, the verse prior to that, chapter 4, verse 15, is my Yan Ganim, Be'er Maim Chaim, Min Lebanon. That's the verse. So, my, my young Ganim, I'm not going to start uh, explaining and translating everything. The end is talking about that Mayan, Mayan is a wellspring, Ganim is, a, is a, like a garden. It's, I'm not going to interpret it this right now. Be'er Maim Chaim is a well of live water. Min Lebanon, coming from Lebanon. Now, Lebanon in many of the scripts is referring to Bet Amigdash and Mashiach and many other things. But what's interesting is that the verse before it tells us, Uri Tzafon, wake up. I put a comma, Tzafon, wake up. There's something going on in the north. And then after that it says, Uvoi Teman, just a hint that, you know, you know that Yemen is 200 kilometers further than Iran? And, of course, not that I'm uh, trying to praise the IAF, but uh, this is not too bad. You're flying all the way there, bombing and coming back. It's basically showing Iran. We, we can bomb you whenever we want with no problems. But uh, what's interesting is that the verse before that, it says, from Lebanon. 
So you have here all the connections already. First of all, he's telling you the north. There's a problem in the north. Where is it coming from? Let's go back to the verse before. From Lebanon. Min Lebanon. Min Lebanon. And more than that, Uvoy Teman. So just a few hints in the text. Now we're going to jump uh, into another uh, verse in the book of uh, Yirmiyahu, Jeremiah, uh, chapter uh, uh, 6, verse, uh, verses 22 and 24. I'm actually, you know, going to take a quick break to, to, to read these verses. Uh, I'll read, I'll zoom through it, but uh, as long as you get the point. The problem is the words in English m make no sense and have no uh, meaning. When you read it in Hebrew, that's when you find the meaning. But the verses in Jeremiah uh, chapter 6, verse 22, it says, So say the Lord, Behold, a people is coming from the north land, and a great nation will be aroused from the ends of the earth. They will grasp, bow, and spear. They are cruel and have no compassion. Their voice roars like the sea, and they ride on horses equipped like a man of war upon, O daughter of Zion. We, were heard, uh, his rep we, heard, we have heard his report, our hands and beco has become feeble, troubled, has grasped us, and pain as a woman in travail. No need to explain much. Now we'll jump to another verse, also in the book of Yirmiyahu, uh, chapter 1, verse 14. That basically everybody likes using that verse. I'm sure you heard about it many times, where it says, Mitzafon tipatach al kol Translation, from the north, the misfortune will break forth upon the inhabitants of the land. So we have a few uh, verses in Prophets that come to basically tell us that the problem will start from the north. I mean, you don't have to be a genius now to figure this out. The reality is that right now in the north of Israel, it's not good. It might seem to us calm, but uh, it's not calm. It's much worse than what we, what we perceive, especially us. I mean, we're not really in the line of fire. But uh, the problem is that if chas v'shalom, the uh, war will break out with Lebanon, that's where it ends. That's going to be the beginning of the end. So I don't know what are the maneuvers or what are the poli uh, political or military uh, decisions that the Israelis do, but... Uh, uh, common sense will say to, to, to pre-attack, not to wait to be attacked, is to do exactly what we did in Six Day War. We don't need the Americans, we don't need anybody. And just to uh, pre-attack, and, and, and that will not necessarily help us win. We will never win, by the way. Don't think, if people think the IAF is going to win the war in Aza, there will never be a victory against the Arabs. Till Mashiach comes, of course. But the army is not going to win no, nothing. Nine months, ten months in Aza and no results? Uh, I'm not going to pass criticism right now because there's a lot of uh, 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 pol pol politics here and a lot of things that are beyond what we understand. But you see, it's straight out with your eyes, this is not how a war is being managed. You see there's no driver to this country. So, because nothing's happening really. And we are, we are the sitting ducks, and nothing really is going to happen. So I don't think the IF or the IDF will wake up one day and save you. They already proved 10 months ago that they're not here to save me. They're not here for anything. So don't put your trust, chas v'shalom, in any form specifically in this country. Don't, uh, not the police, not the government, not the army. You don't have a back in this country. And not to go further away, it's not in any country, but live, we live here, so I, I, I care where I live. But what's important to know, forget about the government right now and how they're running the show. Once the war will open in the north, 
did you know, just did you know, that's where it's the, the end of the beginning. Oh, now is it the opposite, the beginning of the end. And I'll explain a few more things, but let's first try to understand what's the word Safon. I mean, in Hebrew it means north. But why everything is uh, uh, surrounded around the, the word north and the concept of the north. And the thing is that, again, a, most people, 99% of people in the world, and I'll refer now to North America and uh, the Western world, 99% of people don't even know what's going on here. They know how to point fingers about, on everybody. But you don't really know what's going on, really, not behind the scenes, in front of you. Then, of course, even in Israel, the ones we live and experience everything, we don't even know what's going on. We don't have the slightest idea what's going on left and right uh, in, our, in our own land. We are under the impression that the mighty IDF, after October 7, infiltrated into Aza to get our hostages and to destroy Hamas. How did Bibi scream? Ten months later. Half the army is sunk in mud in, in Aza, hundreds of dead, no results. Can you see any result here? I don't see any results. I just see the, 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 the Palestinians mocking us. The whole world is mocking us. And we're under the impression that since we have big bombs and airplanes, that we're winning the war. Then the first news I have for you, when winning any, anything. Winning the war means no Hamas, which means no Aza. That's what people don't understand. So even if you kill now the Hamas militants and you'll get the Hamas heads, did you destroy Hamas? No. Because every Muhammad in Palestine now, in Aza, in 10 years, that's the new Hamas. It's Amalek. You can't negotiate, deal, or do anything with Amalek any other way by chopping their head off. So if you think we're going to have a, a victory over Aza, forget about it. We're not even in the, in the direction for a victory. Because the mentality of the Israeli army and the government, besides how corrupt they are, they're not here to win. This is not a war to win. It's a war to tire everybody out and to use millions of dollars and to hide whatever they want to hide behind that. So don't dream that there's going to be a victory in Aza. There's not going to be a victory in Aza because the only way to have victory there is exactly like a war with Amalek. Nothing left. Then you start new. Because you'll kill whoever you want now. The babies there are the future Hamas. The three-year-olds there are the future Hamas. So you want to get rid of that? First you go get rid of the, of the snake from the head. Hamas is not even the tail of the snake. Therefore, real army strategists will say, why are you dealing with Aza? Go and nuke Iran, wipe Iran off the map. By default, all their allies will back up and you're done. If you wipe Iran off the map, you think Hezbollah is going to have the, the nerve to, to, to send one missile? They'll turn their tails behind their legs and run away. Listen, I was a, a um, I don't know, what's a nice way of saying it? Uh, I don't know how a nice way of saying it. In my youth, I uh, wasn't, uh, uh, how will I say it nicely? I wasn't a nice guy, okay? And I, uh, I dealt with uh, crime and streets and, and a lot of bad situations. When I would get into a bad situation uh, with uh, other people, my first thing would be to go and punch out the strongest guy and knock him out. Because when you knock the first, the strongest guy out, nobody wants to, 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 to be the next one. That's it. That's how one guy takes 20 guys down. You grab the strongest guy, you smash him, now nobody wants to talk to you. That's it. Simple street smarts. Do the same thing with Iran, nobody will talk to you. Drop a few bombs on Iran, wipe Iran off the map, you'll do a favor to the world, trust me. Flatten Iran, There's nothing needs to be there. 
the world suddenly will put you on a pedestal, nobody will talk to you. But since our government is corrupt and managed by the deep state and many other things, nothing like this is going to happen, forget about it. Don't have any uh, hopes that there's going to be some victory, like in the Yom Kippur War, <laughs> victory, some victory. And in the Six Day War, and this time nothing like this is happening because this is Hashem's war. And Hashem is going to crush anyone who stands against him. Even, even a Jew, even a Jew, which we have many of them, especially in our government, you go against Hashem, Hashem is going to destroy you. That's how, that doesn't matter, Jew or non-Jew. So right now the war is a Hashem's war. Hashem, it's Hashem's front. Most important what to take from that, you have nothing to do in this whole thing. You just sit and relax. And follow the Torah and wait for Mashiach. That's it. You have nothing to do here. I mean, of course, you can learn Torah and do chesed and do many good things. But if you think you can uh, make a, a movement or some uh, survey, how do you call it, uh, that everybody signs, a petition. So... First of all, it's important to get the picture right. We are in a war that will not end. October 7, when everything started, when we all sat here, shocked, looking at all the videos. And again, not that I'm claiming to be a prophet or any something in that respect, but I just told everybody. I said that because I'm Israeli. I said, you'll see. We're going to go into Aza and be stuck there for three years. That's it. You'll see what I said. We're not going to go out of Aza. And there'll be hundreds of people dying there, no results, no results. Well, what results? Can you give me one result? What, they, what, what, what result do you see in Aza? I don't see any results besides the destruction of Aza. Okay, that you could have done with one bomb. What is going on right now in Aza, which you call results, could have been done with one bomb with one plane. That's it. Nachon? Tada! Why waste 10 months, hundreds of lives, billions of dollars, you get the same result? Because it doesn't look good, one explosion. Oh, small explosions look better? Drop one bomb, wipe the whole place out of the map, that's it, you're done. So there's no results in Aza, there will be no results in Aza, it's a game. And don't forget, by the way, that I'm saying as a side note, that the both sides of the negotiating the Netanyahu deal and the hostages deal. You know both sides are the same side at the end of the day. There's no true negotiation here. It's all under the same head. It's all one big game that we're being played. So with that said, don't be impressed by anything that they're telling you that's going on in Aza. There's no victory and there's nothing going on in Aza. Rafa, we're going into Rafa, we're going to kill, uh, what's his name? Well, first of all, he didn't kill nobody big yet. When you kill the big ones, then we'll give you some, some applause. The big mighty IDF, you can't find Rihya Sinwar. So you're not that big of an IDF if you can't find a rat underneath the ground. Or you just don't want to find him. Because the boss on the top says, just bomb buildings. Why am I saying all this? Because very soon the front is going to start in Lebanon. The, Le the north is the front. The north is the problem. If Chas Shalom today, Hezbollah, attacks us, we are in, in, in pro we're going to have a, a problem. We are going to be all day long under barrages of missiles and drones and soldiers infiltrating. Hezbollah is not Hamas. Hamas is a bunch of hoodlums. Hezbollah is a lethal, trained terror organization with capabilities that will put our army to a very strong fight. This is not some, uh, in the 60s, some Arabs running on the, on, the, on the mountain with a rifle. They have the Iranians behind them, they have the Russians behind them. This is not a regular war. So this is a war we don't want to start, but don't think uh, maybe there'll be a chance and Hashem will have some mercy on us and the, uh, there won't be a war. It's not if it's going to happen, it's when it's going to happen. So, just to continue, because we have a few more pages to go. So we understand that the place where the evil comes from, or bad, or how the translation says misfortune, it's 
coming from the north. So let's understand why, why the Torah is so particular about the north. So there is a book that is called Pirkei de Rabbi Eliezer. And he says something. First of all, Rabbi, Pirkei de Rabbi Eliezer is uh, uh, the teaching of Rabbi Eliezer ben Orkonos, which uh, the book itself has unbelievable information about the creation of the world and many other things. If you remember, maybe some of you remember, a few years ago on Shabbatot, we used to learn it in the morning. Maybe you remember. But nevertheless, uh, it says there, and we're going to read soon from the book, it says there that there are four winds to the world. I know I promised you many, many times, and it will happen, by the way. I promised you a few times that I'm going to address what the Torah thinks or states or teaches whether we live on a ball or whether we live on a flat uh, plate. So originally I wanted to do a one class. Kind of like I, if you remember, I wanted to do a class about the Erev Rav and it ended up being 24 classes and we just stopped the series. I mean, uh, I have enough material to do 240 classes. I just stopped with those no time, but there's not a shame. When I come back, we'll go back to the Erev Rav series. We didn't even touch this much of the Erev Rav series. And I, I thought it would be a lecture, end up being 24 classes. So it's the same thing with the flat earth. I first thought it would be a quick class. Now from the information I have, it will be probably 40 classes, a series. Because there's over 280 psukim verses in the Tanakh referring to, I'm not going to now say yes or no, but referring to that the earth is flat. So it's a very long series with a lot of information, which we'll have to address another time. And why am I saying that? Because a lot of the information is here. So what does he say? He says the world has four corners. Like we say, from the four corners of the world. But he says there are four corners to the world. He says the world is square. The Kadosh Baruch created the world square. And that's why we say in Kriyat Shema, Me'arba Kanfot Ha'aretz. Kanaf is a end is the, the end of a square why would you say why would we say gather us from all four corners of the world so the world has four corners if the world has four corners how can it be a ball i'm just asking because i go by the torah not by the Illumi the 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 nasa I don't, I don't follow what NASA says. I follow what the Torah says. So I read, Pshat! Arba kanfot ha'aretz. Four corners to the world. That's it. So, <clears throat> you know, let me read from the book. I quoted here a little bit. Let me read. And then I'll translate. It's very, very interesting. And this is in chapter 3, if you want to uh, find it yourself. And again, Pirkei de Rabbi Eliezer. And he says as follows. Arbaruchot ba'olam. The four, the word ruach means wind. But ruach means also uh, 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 sides. Okay? Like where do you see the, the, when you use that term? When you build a sukkah. Okay? You need four uh, walls. Arbaruchot ba'olam. The four, uh, uh, how would you call that? Uh, I forgot in geometry the word in English. Uh, how do you say in geometry, I don't know the word in English, when you have, like, let's say you have a triangle, so you have three, in Hebrew we call it slot. Sides? Sides? Yeah. Oh, no, not a pyramid. Yeah. I, I'm, I mean, the lines, so if it's a, a triangle, it's three lines. If it's a square, it's four lines, right? Yeah. But the line, how do you call the line in English? How? Okay, so it's called aligns? Lines. lines. Ah, okay, so in Hebrew it's called tzela, okay? I, what? <coughs> okay, doesn't matter. What I'm trying to say is that a, a triangle has three lines, okay? Shalosh slot. A, a square has four lines. A side, No, you're right, it's a side, but there's a word for the line itself. 
If there's no word like this in English, maybe you just call it line. It doesn't matter. In Hebrew, it has a specific word. It's called tzela. Nevertheless, let's focus on what we're saying. Why am I saying that? There's arba ruchot. There are four lines to the world. Ruach pinat mizrach. So first of all, the first one is the, the side of east. Ruach pinat amara, ruach pinat adon, ruach pinat azapon. The four sides, uh, uh, winds of uh, the world. And he says as follows. Ruach pinat mizrach, on the eastern side, misham haor yotze leolam. From there, the light comes into the world. Ruach pinat adon, the southern uh, wind, Misham telalei bracha vegishmei bracha yotzim laolam. From there comes all the Jew and rain. Uh, the rains of, rains of blessing. Ruach pinat amarav, the west uh, wind. Misham choshech yotze laolam. From there the, wind, the, the uh, darkness comes to the world. Ruach pinat atzafon, but the northern wind. Misham otzrot ashelig, that's where the... the no, it's snow, yes, but otzar is like, uh, you know how uh, they have somewhere in Finland, I think it's Finland or Greenland, they have like a underground cement uh, vault and they have all the seeds of the world there. You know what I'm talking about? To keep, if chas v'shalom Armageddon, they have all the seeds of the world that they can replant everything, okay? So that's called otzar. It's like, a, it's not really a safe, but it's, a, it's not a fort. It's where you hide something very, very special and it's hidden so well, you don't need to really guide it so much. But nevertheless, it has there like the, all the, the, let's say the best of everything or the fortune. That's called otzar. So it says about the north, misham otzrot asheleg. That's where Hashem keeps all the snow. More than that, Otzrot Abarad. That's where Hashem keeps all the hail. More than that, that's where Hashem uh, uh, contains Kor Vachom, heat and uh, cold, Ugshamim, and the rains that come out to the world. Davar Acher, another thing, Ruach Pinat HaTzafon, Bara Velo Gemaro. Another thing is that the northern corner of the world, Hashem created the entire world, but he left a piece at the end, at the end of the northern corner of the world, undone. Amar, Hashem said, Kol mishi omar shu eloha. Anyone that comes and claims that he's a god, yavo v'yigmor et apina. Come and finish the end. Let me read the whole sentence. Yavo v'yigmor et apina hazot sh'enachti v'yadu hakol shu eloha. Anyone who wants to say that he's a god, please come to the edge of the world, to the corner of the world, and finish what I didn't finish. And by that, we all know that you are a god. So we have here three important things to know. A, there's a corner somewhere. Right? Now, do you think that Rabbi Eliezer ben Orkonos makes something up? No. You think he's talking in riddles? I don't think so. He tells you there's a poor corner in the north. Let's go and look for it. You probably get killed on the way, but because nobody wants you to find that corner. But nevertheless, he says a, in the corner of the northern part, the, the northern, the, how do you call the angle? It's called in Hebrew the zavit. That's where the two corners meet. That's the, the, the uh, zavit, the angle. Apex. Hmm? Apex. Apex. That's, there's a corner. And it's undone. Can you imagine how it looks to go to the corner of the world and see the world undone? Okay. Vesham hu madol mazikim velazvaot. But that northern part that we're talking about is the section or the area where the mazikim, all the spiritual destroyers, are. That's where they they are. And not only that, velazvaot, all the horrors, ruchot v'shedim, spirits, demons, brakim v'reamim, thunder and lightning, u'misham ra'a yotzet la'olam. And all the evil to the world that comes out to the world comes from there. 
שנאמר, מצפון תיפתח הרעה. אני קווטס, what I just read from you for the book of Jeremiah, chapter 1, from the north, ah, what's the translation? I'm sorry, I didn't translate to you. From the north, the misfortune will bre break forth upon all the inhabitants of the land. Okay, let's, uh, no need to read, uh, no need to read too much, let's stay on the topic. Tom. So let's understand what he's telling us. The master of the universe creates the world a square and he puts boundaries and definitions for everything. Nothing in this world is not defined. So Hashem creates a square world, defines the borders. This is this border, this is this border, this is that border. The only thing he doesn't define is the northern border. He leaves the northern border open. And all the evil that comes into the world comes from there. Why? Any idea why? Everything I just said now. Why, why would Hashem create even the option for something bad. I, we just read from one of the greatest sages in our history that all the bad comes from the north, the thunder, the lightning, the demons, the spirits. Does it come through the unfinished corner? That's a good question. The question was that it come from the unfinished corner. From what I, know, from what I understand from the entire chapter, no. The unfinished corner is just as if I imagine it that you climb up to a Mount Everest and when you reach to the top you find something that you didn't expect. So if we will go to some trail looking for the northern part, I'm sure there'll be some surprises. Probably you can make about 20 Hollywood movies and it will be like a Hollywood movie that the ones with the maps put all the pieces together and uh, Indiana Jones and they end up getting there but the bad guy also wants to get there because the money there, exactly like all the movies of The Rock. Right? That's probably the reality. People went on a quest, people went to look for the northern part, and the bad guys who wanted also to find the northern part killed them on the way. And how do you think the movie starts? That's it. I'm sure we're not the first one who are very curious to know where is that northern part and how does it look. But to your, to your question, uh, it's not coming from the unclosed uh, part, it's just the, the, the passage of evil into the world. Now, I'll break it into two questions. First of all, why? Why would Hashem create evil? Uh, I mean, uh, don't you have some uh, rabbis online who says Hashem loves everybody and Hashem is good and uh, all those, uh, uh, I have a show, I, mean, I know Hashem is good and He loves everybody. I'm just trying to mock the ones who are making that, uh, no, there's no evil in the world. Everything's okay. Everything's okay. We're doing great. Well, Hashem loves us. So I know Hashem loves us. We're not doing that great. But nevertheless, my first question is, why would Hashem create the possibility for evil to be entering or penetrating into the world? Question number one. But question number two that I will now derive from question number one is, you know, let's wait with question number two. Let's, let's address why. Why would Hashem create evil? And why would Hashem create this whole thing right now that we just read? If you're such a great uh, uh, creator and you only want to do good to us, why are you punishing me? Why are you punishing me? Have you ever asked Hashem, why are you punishing me? I mean, I asked that a long, many times, like a spoiled brat, that uh, something didn't work my way, and I would complain to Hashem, why are you treating me like this? Why are you punishing me? Why are you not giving me what I want? Each and every one of you has now a prayer in your heart that you don't understand why Hashem is not giving it to you. Maybe you do understand. One person wants to get married, the other one needs money, the other one wants to get divorced. Everyone has a prayer in their heart that doesn't get answered. 
So where is the Hashem is so good? So again, I am curious to know why Hashem created this option. So I won't tease you too long. I'll just give you the answer. Only to be able to prove to anyone that needs to be proven that I am the boss. That's it. Kadosh Bocho created even the opportunity that whenever you decide to turn your back to him with arrogance, thinking you are in control, thinking you have the upper hand, what the Torah is referring to, Kuchi Ve'otzem Yadi, my action, my might, I did. So this refers to the personal, a personal individual, and this is also uh, can uh, apply on a group. So the Ganosh Bohu created, so to say, an army. Uh, I can't find a good name for that. But soldiers to put you in check whenever you lose focus. Saying in other words, the Kadosh Baruch Hu doesn't like Ba'alei uh, Ge'ava, Ga'avtanim, a person who's full of arrogance. Hashem doesn't like these people. Even if you have a lot of mitzvot. Hashem cannot dwell with anyone that has arrogance. It says in Tehilim, Hashem lavash ge'ut lavesh. Hashem is the only one who can be arrogant. And it's not even arrogance. It says ge'ut, ge'ava. But that's only Hashem can do. You're not allowed to. So any person that has arrogance and pride and everything that has to do in that department cannot be in the same place with Hashem. I told you this story many, many times. I'll repeat it for the new students that the once. The Arizal gave over uh, a class and one of his students uh, of the Arizal sat in front of the class uh, in order to give over some Torah. And he started giving over the class and uh, everybody uh, attention got uh, pulled to his unbelievable words. And uh, imagine now the student sitting here and his master, the Arizal, sitting next to him and the rest of the students are facing them. And suddenly they all uh, 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 notice the, uh, uh, the expression on the face of the Rizal changed. He went like that. And a few seconds later, he goes again like that. And a few laters later, again, he has a, 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 a face of shock. And suddenly, he has even a more shocked face and a face of disappointment is on his face, like in his expression. Later on, the students asked him what was going on there. So he said, the rabbi, my student that was giving over the class, gave such unbelievable perspective of the Torah and such unbelievable explanation, such a high level, that the first time that I got shocked, Avraham Avinu walked into the room. He wanted to hear Torah. And the second time I was shocked, Yitzchak came into the room, came from Gan Eden, they wanted to hear this Torah. And then Yaakov came, and Moshe, and David. That's why I kept... I saw the Neshamot coming in. So they asked him, but why you at the end got disappointed? And so he said, I'll tell you why I got disappointed, because the teacher, as he was talking, and he was getting excited from delivering the Torah, a little bit of arrogance and a little bit of ego came to him like, wow, I was able to impress all, all of them. A little ego came in. All the souls of all the tzaddikim left the room. Now, I forgot to tell you one detail. That's what happens when you're trying to cut a story short. After everybody walked in, when he says, Avraham Avinu, Yitzhak Yaakov, Moshe, David, after he says, then the Shechina came in. Hashem came in. And then... Uh, they're all left. And why? And he answered, because Hashem cannot dwell in the same room where a Baal Ge'ava is. If you have Ge'ava, you have pride, you have honor, you, you, you're looking for honor and respect, arrogance, and all that has to do with that, Hashem cannot be together with you. And Hashem doesn't like these people. Now Hashem doesn't hate anyone, by the way. Even the wicked people, 
for whatever reason, I'm not saying that, that's what it says in the Gemara, the Kadosh Baruch Hu chafetz betshuvatam shel reshaim. The Kadosh Baruch Hu wants and is waiting for the tshuva of wicked people. Now again, wicked people, I'm not saying Haman, okay? Or, uh, I don't know what, you name a name. Of course, they're also wicked people. When I read this verse, I understand that it's referring to us. Because if, I, if you go 30 years now down in history, my definition according to the Torah and to any agency was I was wicked. I was rasha. Now when I was secular 30 years ago, I was rasha gamur. Gamur. Complete rasha. But nevertheless, Kadosh Bukhu Khafetz Bitchuvatam Shal Rashaim. Kadosh Bukhu is waiting for the chuva of wicked people. First of all, an important lesson you need to take from that, because we are very judgmental and we look at other people from uh, from above. Don't look at anybody from above because anyone and you don't know who, but the one that you're looking from above can do tshuva, switch his way, and he will leave you behind in the smoke. So don't ever look at a person and, you know, because many great rabbis that you will never even reach through their toenail started as wicked in levels that you will also never reach. And a large amount of the great rabbis in our generation, they're all about tshuvas that came from bad places. Rav Arush Baal Tshuva, Rav Amnon Yitzchak Baal Tshuva, Meir Eliyahu Baal Tshuva. Many, many great rabbis in our generation, the Baal Tshuvas. I can't say on myself I'm a Baal Tshuva, and I don't think I'm that of a great rabbi. But nevertheless, uh, Hashem wants even the evil people to do Tshuva. So when a person is full of Ge'ava, he won't come for it by himself. He needs to be broken. That's usually the case. If you're able to do it by yourself, I hold on myself that exactly how my last name is Anava, the first 30 years, which means humble, the first 30, 30 years of my life, I was the complete opposite. I was the most Baal Geva. Arrogant, you can't even imagine the level of arrogance. Ego, pride, I looked at everybody like junk. You can't even imagine the complete opposite of Anava. And I can express to you <clears throat> that there's only one way how to get out of it. Is let Hashem break you. That's it. You can't do it by yourself. You cannot do it by yourself. If the klipa of Geava is too strong, you won't be able to do it by yourself. The only way I got out of it is Hashem broke me. In levels that I don't wish many people what I went through. How Hashem broke me, about breaking me. That's the only way to break the Klippa Ugeava. So the Kadosh Baruch Hu created a, an army, a system, that when you go out of line, or anyone goes out of line, eventually he will put them back in line. If you have the merit. If you see somebody drifting, 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 and nothing happens, obviously no merits there to do anything. But you see, in most of the cases, a person drifting, 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 then the, the smacks from Hashem start happening. The discipline from Hashem. So look at it in your own life. Just make a little uh, analysis. When you're doing the good in the eyes of Hashem, you can see that the, the challenges are not that bad. Pull up a time in your, in your life where you go a little bit away from Hashem and then make an analogy. What came right after that? A flood? A car accident? A big fine? A lawsuit? What came after when I started drifting away? You have to put the dots together. So, first of all, just so we can continue, we have to understand that there's evil in the world that we have nothing to do with it. You'll never win it. You can't do nothing against it and only Mashiach will win it. That's first of all. They can call it Erev Rav, call it however you want right now, it doesn't matter. There's a certain evil in the world. It spreads into people, governments, agencies, and forth. But there's a certain force of evil in the world you have nothing, you have no power against. Don't even try to even stand against it. The only one who will come to fight it is Melech HaMashiach, King Mashiach. And that's his job. 
Mashiach is not here to fix your problems. He's not coming here to find your wife or to find your job. Mashiach, is, that's not his job. Go to, 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 to the teachings of Rambam and, and, and see what he says about Mashiach. He has a, it's a, it, how do you say? There's a, a job qualification? A what? A job description. Right? There's a, you want to be Mashiach? Go read the description. It's not such a great job, by the way. And one of the jobs is Nilchamit Milchamot Hashem. Fights the wars of Hashem. Mashiach is going to come to fight the Erev Rav. That's it, not you. Because only Mashiach will be able to fight them. Exactly like Neo, like a Matrix. He's going to do things that we're going to all going to be like, what? They're going to come out at him with all the technology that they have. That you can even fathom what they have. And he's just going to do like Neo, like that. And that's it. Exactly. What do you think the Matrix is? So, we have nothing to do with it. That evil, don't even come close to it. It will eat you alive without even thinking. It will consume you like fire. Don't play with that type of fire. But then there's the evil that is around the world because of many things. Evil people, because of many sins, because of many different things which definitely we're not going to analyze it. But there's a lot of evil in the world. Now let me ask you one thing. Somebody in the last five years, ten years, did something bad to you. But for sure, somebody did something bad to you. And you know how you called him? What an evil person. But that evil person that did something bad to you, slandered you, stole from you, cheated you, it doesn't matter. Treated you wrong. You know that for every argument, there's two sides. And as much as you're right in the argument, there's another side to the argument, and in many cases, in their respect, they are right. You are not always right. You know that in order to have an argument, there has to be two people who disagree. That's why how a, a smart person, a smart person doesn't go into arguments. I learned a long time ago, don't go into arguments. Because 99% of, of the time you won't win the argument. You might have the upper hand because your comeback is better than the other person's comeback. But usually arguments you don't win. A smart person, you know how he wins an argument? He agrees with the other side. That's it. How to agree the right way? Now if you're smart, you know how to apply it with your wife, with your kids. I don't, I don't argue 99% of the time, I don't argue with anyone. An argument starts, you start arguing with me. You'll see, you'll meet a brick wall. I'll smile and then move away. And not because I'm afraid to lose the argument, because I know I'm going to win the argument. But when you win the argument, bad things come out of your mouth. That's it. And you are about to fail with either Lashon some type of slandering, foul language, cursing, lying, whatever it is, who needs this? So... <clears throat> Just to summarize this part, the Kadosh Bahu now, I've said that three years ago, four years ago when the corona started, when all the events started, you can mark my words, and I'm sure you remember me saying that numerous times. Hashem is going to bring humanity to its knees. I said that already. That's what's going to happen, one way or another. The faster you go down on your knees, the better for you. But there are ones that don't want to go down on, your knee, on their knees. Hashem is going to put them on their knees. That's it. So now Hashem started the era of Be'apo Mashpil Ge'im. This is a quote from the Nachmanides' letter that with his nose he humiliates the arrogant people. Why with the nose? Because every time we're referring to Hashem's anger, it's referring to the nose. Charon Af and many other terms. Why now? Again, I, I really want the class uh, short, so I'm not explaining every little concept that I like to say. But Hashem already started the, the campaign of I'm going to put everybody down. You think you are running the show? With your arrogance in wherever you're holding? I'll prove to you that not only that you're not running the show, that you are not even nothing to be considered. Now if you understand this way before, then you're good to go. If you know how to do tshuva, if you know how to learn Torah the right way, to bring you to a place of humility, that you know your place, da'at mekomcha. 
The Talmud says, Dalif Nemiya Talmud. Know who you're standing in front of. Everybody is so arrogant, talking like Hashem is their friend, like as if I can do whatever I want. And no, my friend, you don't know who you're dealing with. You think you're dealing here with your buddy? Then Hashem is not your buddy. Hashem loves you. Hashem is the amazing God. Hashem is everything good. But it's not the entity you come face to face. The only way you come forward to Hashem is in humility, in nullification, in awe and respect. Any other way you come to Hashem, you're going to get slapped across the face. You're going to fly from one side of the world to the other. So the smart ones are already on the wagon. They serve Hashem. So if you serve Hashem to whatever extent you can, by default, you are already 50% already humble. You can't serve Hashem and not be humble. Now, the sad reality is that most people serve Hashem, but they're very unhumble. So, you know, somebody today asked me a question. Because in one of my classes, I don't even remember on what specific uh, class and what he was talking about. But I understand what he says. And he, he, he asked, uh, I said something along the line that when bad things happen in your life, then, uh, you know, question yourself. What are, you, what, are you, what are you complaining to everybody? Something bad happens in my life. I don't look at you. I look at myself. What did I do? A person is experiencing hardship. Go through your actions. Maybe you did something. Blame yourself first till you figure out what you did. Say in other words, according to what that person understands, that if you do everything according to what Hashem says, you shouldn't have any suffering. Right? Which kind of makes sense. So that person told me, oh, I know people who follow the Torah to every detail. But they're still suffering and they have challenges. What do you think is the good answer to tell that person? No, maybe from an incarnation, maybe a tikkun, maybe... No, that's not the right answer. You know what was the answer? And he didn't have a, he didn't have a comeback to that. I say, why are you so sure that these people that you think doing all the mitzvot, well, you live with them? You're in the room, you're in a private room with them? Do you know what's in their heart? Do you know what's in their mind? Do you know how that person feels about you? Do you know how much Roshon Ara that person talks? How do you know? Go now to any shul anywhere in the world. That's what the impression I had when I became observant. I would walk into a synagogue and in my <laughs> perception, they were all angels, tzaddikim. Every community, in the first two years of my tshuva, every community that I went to, I thought that's the most holiest community in the world. Three weeks later, I understood it's another community of people like us. He steals, he cheats, he lies, she lies, he talks to Shonara, he... Yes, they all run very quickly in the morning to the synagogue. I also run very quickly. So what? And two minutes later, you lie, you cheat, and you slander. So everyone with a beard and a yarmulke and, uh, you know, out in the public makes you look like they're, they're very observant. I guarantee to you with no question or doubt that whoever you look at, and if you would grade them how religious they are, at home, 50% of it. Including each and every one of you. And myself. You are much more religious next to people. And at home, suddenly you're not that. Because there's nobody there to look at you. You have to be honest with yourself. You are not the same person in the uh, regards to Avodat Hashem, serving Hashem, when you're next to people and you by yourself. That's why the Mishnah says, Kol HaMechalel Shem Shamaim Baseter, any person who desecrates the name of Hashem quietly, but nobody knows, Nifa'im Imeno Bagalui. They pay him back, so to say, out in the open. If I will tell you, I don't even have enough fingers, there's not enough fingers in this room even to count how many people I know, rabbis, scholars, you name it, 
The whole nine yards. That if you look from the far away, wow, what a tzaddik. I'm shutting my mouth in 99% of the cases. I'm waiting just for Hashem to reveal what I already have seen. But you'll see. Wait and you'll see the day of all this, well, not all, a huge amount of the great rabbis that everybody was praising when Hashem is going to put them Hashem is going to put them in the center. He's a molester, he's a rapist, he's a this, he's a that. He's a rabbi because he's making money. He doesn't even practice religion. In my uh, last 20 years, what I have seen. So... <clears throat> The Kadosh Bukhu already started it. It doesn't matter when, but he started it that now he's uh, uh, putting everybody in check and saying, you with me? Yes, prove it. You with me? Yes, prove it. You with me? No. Okay, Pff, kafa. You with me? Another smack to the face. You with me? No, another smack to the face. Till that, it will never end. Because the Kadosh Bukhu wants to bring the redemption in kindness and in mercy. Shem doesn't want to bring destruction on the world. He wants the redemption to come smooth. But it won't come smooth unless we get our act together. Now if it's a single person and you're doing what Hashem requires, like I told you five million times, Tehilim 91, A thousand will fall from here, ten thousand from here. They will come to you. That's what's going to happen. In the final war, some will fall. People, thousand people will fall next to you. You'll just stand there. What? And Hashem gave us a little promo to, show, to see how it is going to look in October 7. That's it. Explain to me how you have 500 people running in a field, all get shot and die. One person somehow, the, the bullets don't pick, uh, uh, hit him. He told me to I told you I met a soldier. 17 or 19 bullets she got shot. Seven, I don't, don't remember. Or 17 or 19. Doesn't go to YouTube, look her up. The whole body, she looks like you know a cabbage doll. That's how she looks. The whole body is like. How do you explain that she didn't die? And all the girls around her, one bullet made the job. Now, of course, we're looking at it in an angle that we don't really attribute to the message Hashem is giving us. Hashem is giving us a message. Let me show you how I choose to which direction which bullet goes. And who will survive, and who will die, and who will suffer, and who will die without suffering. I just see that as Hashem showing us straight out what He can what he wants, that's it. It's no, no, no need to develop too many, too many thoughts here. So, uh, that was a short answer for my question, why did Hashem create evil? But let me continue and then we'll go back to it. It says that Hashem created the world with the letter He. Okay? It says the word, the Olam Azeh, he created with the letter He, Olam Abba created with the letter Yud. The letter He is, uh, I'm sure you all know, but it has like a little leg and like a resh, okay? So it has a bottom, the bottom is open. There's no, uh, there's no uh, floor. Why? Hashem created the world with no bottom, basically telling you, know, you in other words, you want out? Go. You don't want to be here? Go. This is my world. This is my Torah, this is my rules. The rules of the Torah are to help you, to, make, to protect you, to, 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 make you, to make you safe and uh, successful in this world. You don't want? Go. Nobody's holding you. Have you ever heard somebody going out of the synagogue and Hashem reveals himself to him and says, please don't go? Hashem says, you want to go? Oh, that's the attitude. Basically, the attitude is that Hashem says, you're not doing me any favor. When you serve Hashem, if you have this attitude, some people have this attitude. If you're one of them, don't. Some people have the attitude, you're doing Hashem a favor. You're not doing Hashem anything. 
you're doing yourself a favor if you're listening to Hashem. So Hashem says, I'll create the world with an option. You can leave whenever you want. You don't like the physical world at all? Shoot yourself in the head. You don't like my religion? Go seek for other things. Go, go. Do whatever you want. And then he goes like this. Starts the stopwatch. and says, okay, let's see how fast you're going to come back. Let's see how fast you're going to run back home. We have a joke in our house that, uh, that uh, you know, I'm a pretty tough father. I, it might look nice to you now, but I run my show tight. I have seven kids. I can't, uh, uh, you know, have loose ends. So I have to run the house like a platoon. I give my kids a lot of love, a lot of discipline, but I also am very firm. So they all, my kids have a joke that when they were young and I would raise my voice at them, and then uh, they would have a joke that they would get upset and say, you know, I'm running away from home. <coughs> Which I'm sure almost any average child ran away from home once or twice. So recently this uh, concept came up in the, in the dinner table and one of my sons uh, 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 told me that one time when he was young, he did something, whatever, I screamed at him and punished him. And he got upset. He was, I don't know, five, six, I don't even know how old he was. He took his backpack and started putting food in there and all sorts of stuff. And he's like, I'm running away from home. And then he says, and then I went out of the door. I didn't even close the door and I went out. And I was like, how far did you go? He's like, till the elevator. <laughs> and I was like, what, 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 why'd you come back? He's like, well, I just figured out that I'm going to be cold. It's going to be dark. I'm not going to have where to sleep. I'm not going to have food. I'm going to, he's like, uh, you know, it didn't, it, uh, 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 <laughs> it didn't, it wasn't worth it. Yeah, so, so this is a mind of a little kid. But the reality is that we are like that in front of Hashem. So Hashem says, you want to go? Go! Let's see how long you'll survive. A month? Ten years? Twenty years? At some point you'll figure out. Now either you're too stupid to come back, either you're too arrogant to come back, or I don't know, even know what's going on here. Hashem says, I've created the world with a system that nobody's holding you here. Not good for you. That's where the door is. But just remember one thing, that when you want to come back, you're not coming back from the same door. The hay is built with a little leg and a little gap here on the top left. Hashem says, if you ever want to come back, you're going to have to climb through. Exactly. You're going to have to work hard. You're going to have to climb through that gap. You're going to have to really work hard. Now, if you want to make a shortcut and come back from where you came out, you're going to return to be the exact same person. And then what's going to be the result? Nefilot. You fall all the time. That's how Hashem created the world. The thing is that you cannot go back to what you were. If you're trying to go back through the hay where you came out from, the result will be that you go back exactly to how you were. That's the problem with most people. Now, it, 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 first of all, it has to be a Kadosh who had to, to make one side open. That, you know, that, that should be choice. If there won't be one gap open, how would there be choice? Now Hashem could uh, remove free choice and then uh, to tell us what to do, and, but that's not the point of Hashem. That's not the point of Hashem. The Hashem wants you to figure it out by yourself. And by the way, everything that happens to you that Hashem is trying to teach you a lesson, is He wants you to do it by yourself. He's not going against you. He doesn't uh, try to fail you. He wants you to do it by yourself. Now, Like I told you, the Kadosh Baruch Hu had to leave one line open. And why? That there should be a place for a choice. And not only that, we have to understand that the north that we're referring to, that's the side that is the worst of all that is open. If you remember, and I'm definitely not going to elaborate on that right now, because uh, I know I'll sidetrack, but I, I just want to bring up the, the concept that I taught many times, especially before Purim, about the four mitzvot of Purim, all start with Mem, 
and I have explained to you the mem stuma, the square mem, what the Rizal says, the concept is that we need four walls, we need a closed mem. That's how we keep the, the, the Kedusha and the Shekhinah in this world. We need to create a four-walled Mem, which it means the last Mem. You know how Mem has a regular Mem and the last Mem, like Nun and Pei and so forth. We need to, our Mem, our, the world was created with too many gaps. So if you're looking at the hay, gap in the bottom, a gap on the side. We need to achieve a, to a point to, uh, that I can have a closed Mem. That's where Sitim le Mishkan Veshachanti Betocham. Make me a tabernacle and I will dwell in you. You want Hashem to dwell in you, in your life? Then you need to seal the Mem. And how do you do that? Then the story of Purim teaches us because the four lines, the four Memim, are the four mitzvot of Purim. Mikra Megila, Mishloach Manot, Matanot Levionim, Mishteve Simcha. The four mitzvot we need to do in Purim. And each one is telling you what you need to do to have the closed mem. Mikra Megillah, reading the Megillah, is referring to learning Torah. You need to learn Torah. Wall number one, side number one. Next one, Matanot Lev Yunim. Charity. You need to have constantly acts of charity. And do charity. And give. And help. Uh, I'll jump for a second with, uh, with uh, Mishloach Manot. Because that has, needs a more uh, uh, detailed explanation. And then Mishte Simcha, Mishte means a feast, Simcha is joy, is referring to Shabbat, the meals on Shabbat. So you need to have Torah in your life, learning Torah in your life. You need to have a charity, do a lot of charity. You need to observe Shabbat. And the fourth, which, the third, which is Mishloch Manot. Mishloch Manot is a weird mitzvah. I give you a bag of food, you give me a bag of food. Just keep your bag and I'll keep my bag. I don't need your, your, your bag. Especially if I give you a fancy Mishloch Manot and you give me a bag of Bamba. So it's not, you know, I never understood the concept of Mishloch Manot. When I was a kid, I had the worst Mishloch Manot karma. I would bring the Rolls Royce of Mishloch Manot and I would come home with like an empty, half-eaten bag of stale Bamba or like a hard candy that I wouldn't even put in my mouth. And I was like, I just gave you a 200 shekel Mishloch Manot. That's what I'm getting. So the concept of Mishloch Manot is based on the teachings of the Ariya Kadosh, who says that each and every one of us has a godly spark. When I do the concept of Mishloch Manot, I share with you my spark. And then in return, you share with me your spark. This is the ultimate Avat Israel. This is the ultimate opposite of Sinat Chinam, of Baseless Eight. It's me sharing something that is dear for me with you. So you can benefit from that. And in return, you do the same thing for me. And that's the fourth wall, the fourth line, the tzela achona of the mem. Apply all that in your life, you are sealing your mem. You're going to be good. Nothing from the outside is going to come. Remember what he said in the beginning from the north? Ruchot, shedim, mezikim, all the demons. Mezikim is all these, these I don't even know how to translate it, a mazik. Mazik, something that's come to, 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 to destroy, to hurt. The only thing that will protect you, not the Iron Dome, not the alarms that never work. The alarm goes off a minute after the missile is here. Literally, yesterday I'm on the phone. I'm talking with my friend in America. And as we're talking, I hear the explosions. You heard around 5 o'clock. And I'm telling you, oh my God, it's strong explosions. Now he doesn't know what's going on. He's like, run for shelter. What? I'm like... A shelter. So, so I, I started filming it. And you see the, the, all the explosions in the, in the sky? 30 seconds later, the alarm goes off. Oh, really? Oh, thanks for letting me know. <laughs> half the times, the alarms don't work. Well, half the times, they don't work because, uh, because if the missile is intercepted in the sky, the alarm won't go off. But th that's not the point. The point is that... Uh, I, I was saying that your mem is closed, your mishkan is strong and closed. Nothing will happen to you. Nothing will affect you. You will go through this chevlei uh, mashiach uh, uh, from this birth pain of mashiach. You won't even know. I mean, you'll be sad by seeing it, but nothing's going to happen to you. Nothing's going to touch you. Now let's continue. I uh, now explain that Hashem uh, predestined already. 
you to fall. By creating the world with the letter He, showing to us that there's no ground under our feet. I understand from that, don't put your trust in what you see and think that is supporting you. There's no ground under your feet and the reason you're not falling is not because of gravity, that there is no such a thing by the way, it's because Hashem is holding you. That's it. I believe it was uh, Reb Mendel Futterfass. Maybe I'm wrong. I, no, 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 no. I think it's Reb Zusha. No. Forgive me. A great tzaddik in the uh, Soviet Union about 200 plus years ago, so it can be... So, uh, so I don't remember. <coughs> Please forgive me. One of the great tzaddikim, uh, I don't remember the time or the place, but the story is that he used to go every morning in the snow of Russia, he used to go an hour each way to get to a mikveh. And the way for him to get to the mikveh fast is to go up the mountain and down the mountain, not around it. Going around it will take him much more hours. And every day he would do it, and every day he would come on time and pray. And they asked him, how, how, you're an old man. How do you go to the mikveh in the snow, but forget about the snow, they're going up the mountain, that's one problem. How come you don't fall when you go down the mountain? So he answered in a Hasidic way, If you are attached above, you will not fall down below. That's it. You're attached to the world above, you won't fall in this world. Now you have to understand there's no ground under our feet. Hashem created the world with no ground. If you trust the ground, you are trusting to something that doesn't exist. Like you trust the government that doesn't exist or pretends to exist. Or you trust everybody you put your trust in, then there's nothing there. Now why would Hashem design that mechanism? Hashem wants you to fall. I told you already that a million times. You know when the Talmud uh, discussed about the golden calf? What's going on? Why? Who? Why? The sages came to the conclusion that the whole golden calf was a conspiracy of Hashem against humans. I'm not making this up. It says, Nora alila al bnei adam. Kadosh Bukhu did a conspiracy on us. He tricked us. And I tell you that half, if not 80% of the times you fall, that's Hashem's design. Hashem manipulated the situation that you will fall. And you will fall. You can't fight that. And half the times that you fall, when I say fall, I'm not talking fall on the floor fall in your spiritual level. You observe Shabbat for three, four months, boom, you fall one time. You couldn't, couldn't t take the, 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 the pressure. Whatever it is that you are fighting your yetzer, your desire, and you fight, 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 boom, you fall. You can't anymore. Everybody in their, in their respect. But Hashem designs these nefilot, these falls. You know why? No. Hmm? Huh? You're right to return to him. You're right. He wants you to return. That's right. But the reason why Hashem will design for you a downfall or for you failing, He wants to see you come back by yourself. He will make you understand the severity. He will make you understand why you want to observe that particular thing. And then He's going to keep pushing you all the time. To see when you will get the tools or the, 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 the way to rise up by yourself. First few times he'll help you. But eventually he wants you to get to a point that he, he knows that when you fall you know how to get up. How did you say that last week? That you need to know how to fall. That's also... Falling is not a, every all fall. Now learn how to fall. That I liked what you said. I'm saying, you need, Hashem wants you to see how you get up. 
He, needs to, he wants you to do it by yourself. Not depending on anyone. Not going and whining to anybody. Not going and blaming anybody. Deal with it and get up by yourself. So Hashem is really your personal trainer. And all the bad things that happen to you is for you to become stronger. To become more dedicated. To become more focused on Hashem. To make you stronger. But Hashem wants you to do it by yourself. Now. Now we're in a point. Take everything that I just told you now. Now we're in a point that Hashem already, is already way past the starting point. And everything that Hashem does is because Hashem wants to bring humanity to its knees. And that's what's going to happen. And you can mark my words. What you see now in the world, that's not even a war. If you think thinking Israel is in the war, that's not a war. That's, I don't know, how, I don't know how to call it, but that's not a war. The weak war that is coming is inevitable. It will be coming. It will happen. You can't change that. We can change if it's going to happen on us or going to happen on the other side of the world. That you can change. But we're going through the redemption canal according to Hashem's time, according to Hashem's plan, according to how Hashem wants to align everything. Really, a smart person right now, don't take my words, but a smart person goes and builds a little house on the mountain in the middle of nowhere, plants some food, and sits in their Torah all day long. That's the smart person. Disappear off the face of the earth and just learn Torah all day long. And, and listen, 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 don't listen to me. Now all I need now, people complaining to me, I lost my job because you told me to go and learn Torah. I'm telling you what, a, what, a, 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 what would be the right uh, approach. Of course you can't do that because you need a job to get money and etc, etc. But very soon, don't worry, very soon all this is over. All this is over very, very soon. And Hashem is going to bring us to another test. Let's see how you survive without what you were irregular to have in the last 10, 10, 20, 30 years. I'm already preparing you now, and it's not for the topic what I want to talk about now. What we're going through now is nothing. I told you that through all the stages. This is not the show. This is not even the promo. It's not even the rehearsal. You're seeing explosions and, and uh, a lot of action. This is nothing, my dear friends. And again, things can change if we do tshuva as a nation, as a whole, as a single person. Eh, Hashem has His ways. But right now, the Kadosh Bohu's agenda is to make sure everybody knows He is the God. Now you're talking about billions of people here that's going to need, going to be need to be pushed down to their knees. And when I use the term "push down to their knees," is when you reach. Excuse me, when you reach to a point that you can't take anymore, or a point that you know you have no chance of winning, what do you do? You surrender. And you surrender with your hands up and you bow down on your knees. Hashem is going to break everybody now. He's breaking everybody now. If you're smart, you don't take that as a punishment, you take that as life lessons, and instead of fighting the wave, you ride the wave. That's it. That's all the advice I can give you. But I'm already telling you, Hashem is now in the, in the, in the state, is till you're not going to come back to me on your knees, I will not stop. 20 years ago, Hashem would leave you alone. Now, till you say, die, enough, I'm not leaving you alone. And you will intensify. So buckle up, take a deep breath, it's just started. And if you want to uh, reduce all this, one line with Hashem. Not like this person who asked me today, oh, I see so many people, how did he tell me? They're, they're not missing anything. I don't remember the term he used, but according to me, oh, I know people, they do all the mitzvot and everything. Which I looked at him like, come on. What, you're judging according to what you see them in the street? Let, let's, let's do it the other way around. Look at me. Let's practice now what I, what, what I want to make a, a point of. Look at me. Now, if you look at me, what do you think? Oh, Rabbi Nava, what a tzaddik. That's what I hear. Oh, oh. So you see what you see. Do you see what's going on in my house? Do you see what's going on in my heart, in my mind? You, I might look to you very observant. I might look to you in a very high level. 
right? You know what's going on in my mind? You know my challenges? You know my Yetzirah? You know what I do in closed doors? No, you don't. So how do you come to the assumption that I'm such a great person? Because I have a long beard? And I have a yarmulke and I teach Torah? That's why you qualify me as to be a great individual spiritually? You don't know nothing about me. So what if I have a beard and I pray and I do, do charity and learn Torah? And that doesn't mean anything. I know people who do ten times more than me and they do horrible things that I don't even want to say out loud. But well, there's no great rabbis that were caught raping kids. So what, 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 what is your Torah worth? And yeah, I can come, come out, show up now anywhere and play the part. You will think that I'm pious, like the person who told me today. They're also pious. Listen, 99% of the observant Jews on the outside look pious. Go now to any religious neighborhood. You look at the people. Doesn't matter what they do, they look uh, totally attached to Hashem. I will break your, your fantasy or your dream or whatever you want to call it. Half of them are fraud. Half of them is Purim. That's it. It's just the way how they dress. And I'm being nice with them saying half. Somebody called me the other day and asked me if I can participate in a survey. I said, how long would it take? Eh, two, three minutes. I said, what's the survey about? What's your opinion about drafting the Haredi into the army? I said, I want to take the survey. That poor person that fell on me. <laughs> he didn't know what he fell on. <laughs> <coughs> but, <coughs> <coughs> but part of what I answered, I said, listen, he's like, what's your stand about drafting the Haredi uh, uh, pe uh, people to the army. I said, if it's a real Haredi, don't touch him. Just leave him in the, in the Bet Midrash. That's like four platoons or four divisions. A real Haredi. But if he's not a real Haredi, then, take it, then if you need, take him to the army. Besides the fact, that's my personal opinion, 90% of the Haredis, the Orthodox, they want to take to the army, the army doesn't need them. They're not army material. And the army knows that. Listen, when I grew up as a secular boy, I, I was army material. Okay? All my life, I was in sports, martial arts. I mean, I, I'm a, I was, a, I'm a, you know, all, all my body cuts. And I want to see you taking some Ashkenazi guy from Memea Shearim who sits in yeshiva with fluorescent lights since the age of three, never kicked the ball, never did one pull-up on a bar, doesn't even know how to do push-ups, put him in a fight, he doesn't even know how to throw a punch. That's army material! You put the army gear on him, he will sink in the ground with the gear! That's Torah material! That's a person who needs to sit and learn Torah, for the benefit of the rest of Am Israel, and the one who fits to the army, take to the army. Why are you taking me, these skinny boys from, uh, from Yeshiva? They, they don't even, they barely, they barely lift up the Gemara. You want him to jump on a mountain and start shooting? It's not army material. That's one thing. But if a person is real Haredi, and he's really learning Torah, you don't dare touch him. That's our power. But if you're sitting outside and smoking and bumming, bumming around, it doesn't matter for me if you're orthodox or left-wing liberal. I heard an interview with Jonathan Pollard, and he said, no problem. You want to draft the Haredis? I want the same exact draft to the left-wing liberal secular. There are more left-wing liberal secular people who don't go to the army in ratio than the Haredi community. Guarantee. I know that for a fact. I'm talking about the, the left-wing, ultra-left-wing liberals in Israel. They don't go to the army. They call it the army of the Tzvaki Bush. The army of, uh, how do they call it? How do you say it in English? The, the oppressing army, the whatever they call it. A conquered army. Uh, Jews, liberal Jews in Israel who, who uh, 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 vote for the Arabs, 
If they go to Arab villages, why don't you draft them? They're more in, in amounts and in ratio than the Orthodox. So Jonathan Pollard, I heard an interview. He says, no problem. You want to draft the Haredi? Do also a draft to the secular liberals. Shmolanim. Same, no? So, <clears throat> I don't even know how I, I got sidetracked with that. But the point that I want to make before I'm moving on to the next part is at this point, and there's no way to reverse it, at this point Hashem started His process to make sure everyone is either with Him or you out. And there's not going to be a lot of people left by the time Mashiach will come. Prophecy is talking about two-thirds of the world that will be destroyed. That's also being conservative. There are places in holy books that are saying, I saw one place that it says that Mashiach will only have 7,000 students. That's it. 7 billion people in the world. Only 7,000 will be worthy and have the merit to stand next to Mashiach. I don't know how much reliable that source. It was an opinion of, 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 of. Doesn't matter. It's a pretty strong opinion. <clears throat> Okay, let's continue, because we really, uh, uh, we're not even in the beginning. Uh, we just learned in the parashot recently about our uh, dear friends Bil'am and Balak, okay? You know the whole story, they wanted to destroy uh, Israel, uh, the nation of Israel, Balak, maybe Rob Bil'am, you know the whole story, I'm not, I'm not going to uh, add on that. But when Balak and Bil'am... Uh, came to approach the mission, so to say, they understood the army, this is not a battle with an army. And they understood very quickly uh, from Bil'am that even their curses and their witchcraft and their magic doesn't work. They figured it out very fast. Okay, there's something uh, that came up to my mind from something that I learned now. I, I, sorry for the pause, I'm, I'm not going to address it now. But let me uh, uh, first that. Bilam and Balak figured out very quickly that even the magic and the sorcery won't work. Uh, now why they saw that it didn't work? Because at the time, Hashem saw many of the nation of Israel doing tshuva, and in the merit of the, those who did tshuva, then Hashem protected the nation of Israel. To a point that Bil'am, in his spiritual level, who was a very high spiritual level, you have to understand that uh, Bil'am is the same level in, of Moshe Rabbeinu. Bil'am is the Laumadze. That's how high Bil'am uh, 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 could have reached. So Bil'am right away said, this won't work. It just won't work. Let's turn off, take your money back. I'll give you a 30-day money back guarantee. It won't work. They understood that. They saw that. And they understood that when the nation of Israel returned to Hashem, nobody can touch them. The problem right now is that we are very scattered, spiritually and physically. We're not really united. I don't buy the quotes that people say that there's ahdut and there's unity and there's unity maybe somewhere else i don't see much of a unity maybe you see unity i don't see a unity i don't see ahdut i don't see about israel Nahon, I, uh, many tell me you choose to see the negative so my answer is i choose to see the reality i don't choose negative or positive i see what i see and that's what it is you want to argue with me right now show me all the avat israel I'll show you the 500 emails that I get threats and curses and, and uh, slandering and everything to my direction. Everything you'll come and show me, I'll show you a thousand times more. There's no unity in our nation. End of story. There's fake unity. You know where the unity is? In a single group. But this group, which there's a lot of unity, which is fake, of course, with that group there's no unity. So you're united in your own little group, which is that fake because you're not really united. But between the groups and between the, 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 the congregations, so the, the bottom line is, stop faking it. There's no unity. Uh, the achdut that we have is this big. And Avat Yisrael is not... It's all... I, 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 I don't buy 
the fake campaign that we're doing great. If we were doing great, we wouldn't be where we were right now. There's a lot of Sinat Chinam, baseless hate, a lot of machlokot, a lot of disagreements, a lot of hate, and of course something needs to be done. But let's continue. <coughs> All the problems that come to our direction is because there's no definition and there's no borders. I will repeat it again. All the troubles and mishaps that happen to you or happen generally, it's because there's no definition to things and there's no borders. The Torah is all about definitions and borders. Once you break the definitions, I'm a man, I'm a woman, I identify as a male, female, I'm, you broke the definitions, we're going to have problems. There's uh, borders. You break the borders, there's going to be problems. Problems, I mean, all the, all the junk you need to deal with. All the, ch the, the, the challenges and everything, else, everything that comes with it. <clears throat> Saying in other words, there's only Torah. There's only the rules and the logic of the Torah, even if it doesn't make logic to you. Now, <clears throat> I have a lot more to say, but I really want to zoom, so I want to move to a completely different thing that we saw in the, next, uh, in the last few days. I want to put it all together. Tomorrow, Be'ezrat Hashem is Yudzayin Betamuz. I will address it in a few minutes. But also something very interesting uh, is happening in the world in the last few days that everybody's kind of wondering why, who, what. And I'm sure you're already guessing that I'm uh, going to talk about the fact that uh, uh, Biden is uh, uh, backing out and Trump was... Uh, 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 they tried to assassinate him. Uh, <clears throat> and of course the Secret Service couldn't figure out that there's a sniper on the roof and the civilians had to let the Secret Service, uh, he's over there, and nine shots went out, nothing hit nobody, and uh, <clears throat> so I'm not going to start uh, interpreting that. I'm just going to uh, address the fact that this is connected to Yudzayin Betemuz, and I want to explain to you. Nothing happens by chance. Everything has a meaning. The tour, there are uh, different types of commentaries. One of the uh, 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 commentaries to keep it simple is called Tur. Okay, he says, "Kol parasha sheba lifnei chag." Every parasha, the weekly portion that comes before the holiday, nimtza sham hasod shel chag. Read that parasha and you'll find the secret of that holiday. Saying, in other words, that the secret of the if you're cold, you can turn the air on, uh, air off. Uh, the secret of the holiday of Pesach can be found in Parashat Tzav if the year is a simple year. If it's a leap year, then in Parashat Metzorah, which will be the parasha before Pesach, you will find the secret of the holiday of Pesach. <coughs> Excuse me. Rosh Hashanah, Parashat Nitzavim. Shavuot, Parashat Mamidbar. Look at the, the, the holiday and the parasha before. The Shalah Kadosh, he says it's not only on the holidays that you just mentioned. It's also on Hanukkah, also on Purim, also, as, also on Masara Betevet, also on everything. So, let's, if we want to find out what's the secret of Yudzayin Betemuz, so let's go to the parasha the week before, right? <coughs> so, the parasha, of course, is Balak. And, uh, and just as you know, if you're already following, the parasha that will be before Tisha B'Av will be parasha Dvarim. But if you want to know on the holiday or the event, read the parasha of the Shabbat preceding it. So to understand that, what, what really happened on Yudzayin Betamuz? Tomorrow, it's in a few uh, uh, minutes already. On Yudzayin Betamuz, five things happen. It says in the Mishnah, in Tractate uh, Ta'anit, uh, page 26, that five things happen on uh, Yudzayin Betamuz. The first thing that happened, the tablets broke. Moshe Rabbeinu came down from the mountain, saw the golden calf, and the tablets broke. Second thing that happened, Bitul Korban Atamid. 
uh, the temple was destroyed and there was a korban that constantly has, there's a constant fire that has to be burning and a certain offer that is, uh, needs to be given and the korban tamid was uh, cancelled. Big problem to Eretz Israel, to uh, the, uh, the nation of Israel. The third thing, <coughs> the breaking of the walls of Yerushalayim. Fourth thing, uh, burning of a Sefer Torah by Apostomos Imach Shimo. And the fifth thing is putting a sculpture uh, idol uh, in the Holy Temple. These are the five things that happen in Yudzayin Betamud. That you, just that you know what to think of when you're fasting tomorrow and when you're trying to do tshuva. <coughs> it says in uh, Parashat, uh, sorry, in, uh, in the book of Dvarim, uh, chapter 22, verse 4, in our parasha, it says, I'm just going to translate it in, in English, read in English, Moab said to the elders of Midian, Now this assembly will eat up everything around us as ox eat up the greens of the field. That's a verse from last week's parasha. When it's talking about Esev Hasadeh, and you have to remember the two words, Esev Hasadeh, the translation in English, the greens of the field. Esev Hasadeh, let me explain to you what Bil Bilam and Balak wanted to do. They wanted to arouse again the power of the ox to awaken the sin of the golden calf. Because the golden calf, of course, how was the sin? With a, with, a, with a calf, with an ox. Now, I'll explain in a second the concept, but you have to see how interesting how the Torah gives you hints for everything. And I'll explain in a second what does it mean to waken up the golden calf, the sin of the golden calf. But when you're going to the word that the Torah is referring to, is Esev. Esev, the translation is greens of the field. But Esev can also be weed or grass. The acronym of the word Esev is Shva, Shiva Asar Betamuz. Esev is Ein Sin Bet, which is the acronym of Shiva Asar Betamuz, 17th of Tammuz. Now, What's the connection to the ox? Is the golden calf. The, the foundation, the basics of what Moab wanted to do is to bring back, to awaken the sin of the golden calf. Because the nation of Israel sinned in the golden calf and they were forgiven. They were forgiven. But nevertheless, they went against the master of the universe. Moab, that's what they wanted to do. He wanted to reverse engineer, so to say, and wake up the, 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 that sin. It's almost like you had a sin, I don't know, you used to do all your life. Finally you got rid of it. 20 years you clean. And the Yetzirah knows that that's your, your weak point. That's where, you, where you'll cave. And if the Yetzirah wants to bring you down, he goes full force to that. So, <clears throat> that's what Moab wanted. Moab wanted to waken up the, the, the sin of the golden calf. Therefore, in the verse, that's what he's saying that is hinting to us already on Shiva Asar Betamuz. In a second, I'll put all the dots together. But let's learn of another thing that happened on Shiva Asar Betamuz. The Khatam Sofer explains that Ruth and Boaz got married the, today. The 16th day of Tammuz. That was their wedding. Unfortunately, the wedding didn't last long because Boaz died the next day. So, another thing that we're learning, Yudzayim with Tammuz is the yard site of Boaz. And the night before that, Tzayim with Tammuz is the wedding of Ruth and Boaz. Now, that's not a regular wedding. That's the beginning of the dynasty of King David. So the 16th day of Tammuz is the unification of Ruth and Boaz. Who Ruth was Bechlal Moaviyah. She was a Moabite. You're not allowed to bring a Moabite into your house, into the house of Israel. But that just goes to show you how Hashem wants to bring Mashiach. Mashiach comes from the worst place possible. Mashiach comes from Lot, 
from incest, from not being with his daughter. That's where Mashiach comes from. Mashiach is coming from the furthest away, from the depth of the klipa, and as many are convinced, and the sources do that, Mashiach is going to be about tshuva. It's not going to be some uh, lineage from uh, Bnei Brak. It's going to be about tshuva. Only about tshuva can deal with stuff like that. But nevertheless, about tshuva has an upper hand on a from, from birth that he got there by himself. Any about tshuva. So I also strong, hold strong that Mashiach is going to be about Shuvah, but also I add on that that there's the soul of Mashiach, there's the body where Mashiach, the soul of Mashiach will be dwelling in. So uh, don't uh, think tomorrow you Mashiach. Okay? <clears throat> I have enough Mashiachs emailing me all day long. <laughs> Everybody, um, I mean, I, I, Rabbi Nava, we need to talk. I'm uh, the son of David. Uh, we need to meet. I don't know why they want to meet me. You Mashiach, come and redeem the world. Then come and meet me. But the point is that uh, the house of King David, the lineage of King David was established tonight. Our holy sages and holy books explain that tonight is one of the most powerful nights to pray, A, for other, to Shiduch, for other half. B, to pray for Shlombayit, but also for hastening the redemption. But any prayer you'll recite tonight is a very powerful night. Why? Because this is the night where the beginning of our Redeemer starts from. That's where it all occurred. And when? A day before Yudzayin Betamuz. Which, what is the hint that we're getting on Yudzayin Betamuz? Where's the hint? In the, the, in the Esev. Asara, as, shiva asar betamuz. What is the concept of the Esev? What does the Moab want? To awaken the golden calf. To awaken the heresy in me, to awaken my questioning into God, to awaken me, I can do it by myself. I don't need you. I can do it by myself. <clears throat> and we have to understand that besides everything that I'm talking about, that you have to take what we learned tonight and apply tonight is a very, very, very powerful night to, to prayer. It says... In the Torah, Vayar Balak ben Tzipor. That Balak, the son of Tzipor, he saw. What did he see? What is the Torah saying? Vayar Balak ben Tzipor. What did he see? He was, saw Netflix. What did he see? He saw what is future to come out from us. He saw King David. He saw Melech HaMashiach. He saw everything. When he saw, when it says Vayar Balak, not he was afraid. He saw. What did he see? What's going to come out from us? In the book of Amidvar, chapter 22, verse 3, it says, Moab became terrified of the people. Why are you being terrified from the people? Because he saw into the future. He saw that from Ruth and Boaz will come Oved, and then Ishai, and then comes King David. And one king, once King David comes... I mean, we're calling him now King David in regards to this uh, matter. But we also call Melech HaMashiach, Malka David Meshicha. He's, he's, that's for us our Mashiach. Not King David. I'm not saying King David is the Mashiach. But we're referring to the Neshama of Mashiach, which I've explained is connected with, between Adam HaRishon, David HaMelech, and Melech HaMashiach. I gave you already that class. That's what Moab saw. What is going to happen? So I need to stop it now. Exactly like Moshe Rabbeinu, his sorcerers told him, they looked in the stars, all the stargazers, and they told him, today the Redeemer was born, when Moshe Rabbeinu was born. And what was the result? Every male boy, boy that was born, throw him to the, to the Nile. That decree came because the sorcerers told Paro, today the Redeemer was born. So they had to kill all the male, bo bo all the male boys. So, same thing here. He saw what's going to happen. Therefore, we got to destroy them. And what's the result, by the way? There's no more Moab. You want to destroy the, the nation of Israel? How is the Torah says? Vayikatz Moab mipnei, vayikatz moab mipnei bnei Israel. That Vayikatz Ketz doesn't exist anymore. Anyways, 
The night of Yudzayin Betamuz, which is tonight, that's the night that the dynasty of King David started. Uh, and uh, like I told you, a very strong uh, 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 power that signified to Moab uh, that what's going to come out in the future from our lineage and brought great uh, fear and, uh, and, uh, and trembling on them. Now, I started talking about Biden and Trump. Uh, okay. Our sages explain, it says in the Torah very clearly, there are four animals that are, they have kosher signs, but they're not kosher. The rabbit, the camel, the hyrax, and the pig. Okay? Shafan, Arnevet, Chazir, Gamal. The hyrax and the rabbit and the camel, they share the same thing. They chew their cud. But they don't have a split hoof. Since, the shame, since they share the same sign, they're in the same verse. The pig, on the other hand, doesn't chew its cud, but he has split hoofs. Different sign, he gets his own, his own verse. Why, our sages ask, why uh, does the pig call in Hebrew chazir? Then our sages explain that these four animals correspond to the four malchuyot, the four nations, the four kingdoms that will control the nation of Israel. The first one is Malchut Babel, the Babylonians. Second one is Malchut Madai, Persia, Haman. Third one is Greece, Antiochus. And the fourth one is Edom. Our sages explain the camel the exile of Babylon, of Babel, the, the, the Malchut Babel corresponds to the camel. And now not the time to explain. The, uh, the rabbit corresponds to Persia, to the exile and to the uh, Malchut, the uh, entity that is controlling us. The hyrax is for Greece and the pig corresponds to Mamlechet Edom. Now again, the question is, why is it called Chazir? Pig in Hebrew is Chazir. Our sages answer, Atid lachzir haketer lemelech hamashiach. The nation of Edom is future to return the crown to King Mashiach. And that's why the animal that corresponds to that malchut is Chazir. And again, chazir, same roots in the word in Hebrew, lachzir, chazar, return. And why mamlechet Edom corresponds to chazir? Why is he called chazir? Shatid lachzir et haketer lemelech hamashiach. Mamlechet Edom, you can call it the kingdom of Edom, it's also known as Romi, you can call it in many different names. We know who they are. They're holding the crown right now. But very soon, Mashiach is going to come and going to tell their leader, Give me back my crown. And then there's going to be a fight. And then Mashiach will destroy Malchut Arisha and the entire Erev Rav and take his crown back. Now what's interesting here is that we're talking about right now the Galut Edom. Now it's not really called the Galut because the Galuyot are different. This is called Malchuyot. This is called Shi'abud Malchuyot. When another nation is controlling me. Like the Babylonians came, took over the nation of Israel, the, destroyed the temple. Same thing with the Greeks. Same thing with the Romans. Right now, we're dealing with Malchut Edom. So if Malchut Edom is Romi, and Malchut Edom is the Western world, don't you think it's more than just a coincidence that the leader of nation of Edom is a redhead, exactly how the Torah call redheads Admoni, so the leader of Edom right now is Trump, who is a redhead, as the Torah call him Admoni, for Esav or anyone. Now you clearly understand why Biden steps down. You think that individual can accept, uh, greet Mashiach? He'll go the other direction. 
He doesn't even know who he's named. That's a person who can greet Mashiach. He'll go up the stairs and fall or something. No offense. He, you know, he's not so healthy in his head. But why would Hashem save Trump? It doesn't matter right now who tried to assassinate him. Whether it was uh, the Obama administration, whether it was his own administration to get popularity. I mean, his popularity went up the roof right now. Hey, can you shoot me? Take my ear down. I'm going to break the box. Uh, my, my ratings will go up. No, I don't think he's that stupid, but uh, you know, that's taking a great, a great chance. Can you shoot me for a second right here? Try not to miss. It's everything. It's everything. I don't want to now psychoanalyze everything that happened there. Uh, is conspiracy, not conspiracy. All I can tell you is I think uh, the Secret Service failed. And uh, that's all I can tell you. And if the people saw the sniper on the roof, that's, I don't have what more to add. Where the conspiracy came from, or, wh or where something went wrong, it's, for me it's just uh, another show. Yeah, it, and it doesn't matter who tried to assassinate him, if it was even a, uh, an assassination attempt, or if it's fake, or if it's real, the whole show, it was a show, and that was a nice show. You know, now they're laughing at everybody and the, the woman from the Secret Service can't even put her gun down. I don't even know what was going on there. And now the Secret Service announced that they don't want to take any more gigs for, for uh, Trump. <laughs> so, again, all the, Kirk, the, the circus around. The circus is just for us to laugh. But a quick, a quick analysis, let's assume there was a, 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 a real... Uh, 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 an attempt to assassinate uh, uh, former President Trump. I'm not questioning, I'm not doubting, I don't care. I'm not even trying to look into it, where it came from, how it came from. I only saw three minutes of the entire thing to see the circus and to move on. That's it. I get from that that it's another hint from Hashem how close we are to the redemption and how Hashem is setting his soldiers on the chess board. Because everything is a move. Whatever you see, it's a move on the chess board. And Hashem is going to do a checkmate. You can't even imagine the maneuver of what Hashem is going to do. If you like chess and you appreciate the wisdom behind it, then follow what Hashem is doing. That's going to be the best checkmate move you ever saw. How? What? Not that I'm proud of it, but in jail you play chess. I'm a pretty good chess player. So you appreciate good... Uh, that's, that's what you do in, in jail. But, uh, and a few other activities. But uh, a, a good chess player really, really uh, appreciates good maneuvers. Look at the maneuvers that Hashem is doing. Just look at them and look at the, I don't know if I'm using the right word. The maneuver. Hashem is moving this right now. It doesn't make sense because he's coming from here. That's why we need to read between the lines. You need to see. We don't look at this, the circus in front of you. The entire encounter with Trump. I see it. The Gadosh Yeah, he did a miracle. To save him because he is the leader, so called, of the nation of Edom. Saying, in other words, maybe Hashem is saying, I'm going to make him next president. And yeah, I'm not predicting anything. Um, and by the way, I have no politi political stance. I don't support any politician. Not Biden or Trump. I'm not a Trump supporter or a Biden supporter. I'm not a, any supporter of any politicians. Not that I'm now I'm holding some uh, uh, side. But with no doubt, you see a very... Uh, 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 closed circle how all the events come together and in the beginning I was really tempted to start opening the books and finding sources, gematriot, bullet in the ear, I don't know, I was, I was like I'll find something as people now posted online with the, the, the blood of the right ear that Moshe Rabbeinu puts on Aaron you can find hints in everything 
And I'm sure that if I would dig deep down, down d deep enough, I will find some cool stuff that the connection. But I don't need to do that. I want to move on because I run a, I rather do something. You know what I see from the encounter, Trump uh, attempt of association uh, of assassination. <clears throat> I was a sniper in the Israeli army. I know how to shoot from far away, and I also know where to shoot if you want to make sure that the person doesn't make it. So there are different rules for snipers. Where do you shoot? Do you shoot the brain? Do you shoot the heart? What do you shoot? Don't forget, you are a kilometer away. Your bullet will go with the air and the weight of the bullet, and depending on the temperature, the bullet can go two millimeters to the side if you're not calculating the distance and everything. So, Okay, they're showing, I saw the video, uh, like a 3D head, and he moves, and where the bullet was supposed to go in. I can tell you already it's not a professional sniper, because the professional sniper will not go to the back of the head. But nevertheless, that's not the point. The point is, why the right ear? Very simple, my dear friends. Naase venishma. Okay? That's what the nation of Israel said when we're about to get the Torah. Here it has to be the other way around. Nishma, but we're missing the Nasi. That is our problem. You listen. You listen to Hashem. You try at least. But the Nasi, Nasi means to do. So Moab, when he wanted to get rid of us, he wanted to waken up the golden calf. The energy, the approach, the, the, the way of thinking that the basics of it is heresy. That I don't need Hashem. What's the basis of the golden calf? Moshe Rabbeinu didn't come down. Moshe Rabbeinu, the Satan showed that Moshe Rabbeinu died. He showed them a vision of their funeral in Shamaim. And what did the Erev Rav say? If we don't have that God, we'll make another God. That's the golden calf. Say in other words, there's a replacement to any God that we want. So the concept of Moab, Balak, Moab, Bilam, is to bring you back to the place of heresy. Now let me ask you something. The thing is, and I'm not trying to insult anybody. Most people, are, uh, 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 their behavior is, is like a heretic. How they talk. With the beard and the yarmulke and everything. Now if you don't believe 100% and you practice it, your parnasa comes from Hashem. All the things, the bad things that people do to you, comes from Hashem. Your misfortune, your success. The reality, it's easier said than done. In theory, of course I know everything comes from Hashem. Of course I know my parnasah, my livelihood comes from Hashem. I know. In theory. And check yourself. I'm talking to all of you. The ones who are observant and follow the Torah and love Hashem. You are far away from being in the level what you're destined to be. Because you have a yetzerah, you have an evil inclination, you have tons of desires. Tons of lusts, distractions from here till tomorrow. You know how many times a day I ask Hashem, why do I need to deal with the distractions? You know, Hashem, if you won't put the distractions, I would learn triple Torah. I will teach three times as much Torah. Move these, these distractions from me. But the distractions still come. Hashem says, I don't need you to learn five hours Torah. Five hours? I don't need you. I need you to learn half an hour focused with all the challenges sitting here. Put the switch down and now let you see, let's see you learn Torah. I don't need you to learn 12 hours Torah when everything is nice and calm. What's the chokhmah? What's the... What's the... No. What's the challenge here? Put me now in an island and food comes there automatically, I will learn Torah 20 hours a day. And love it. And teach Torah all day long. Wouldn't you think that's what Hashem wants? 
Shem Sfer says, I want you to deal 24 hours a day with challenges to a point that you are, you can't even contain more challenges. Now learn Torah! Is it easy? No. 20 years ago, exactly now, this is the period. I learned in yeshiva, and that yeshiva used to go every summer to the uh, mountains uh, upstate in New York. I used to call it Gan Eden. We would go there for two months. There wasn't even a, a single for the phones. I'm talking about internet. Phone. There wasn't any phone there even. There was a river in the back. That was our mikveh. I would wake up in the morning, five in the morning, learn Torah till 12 o'clock at night. Only come down from the Bet Midrash to eat shacharit, food on the table. Eat, say Birkat Amazon, go back to, to learn and pray. Come back for afternoon, same thing. I said to my wife, this is Gan Eden. Learning Torah, no distractions, no phone, no nothing. Oh, they paid me too, like a kolil. It wasn't that much, it was $100 a week, but, but I'm just saying, kilo, and, and they paid me. And for two months I would just learn Torah and everything was catered to me. And I thought, that's the setting that I want to be. I want to be in a setting where I have my little corner and just to focus on learning Torah. That's what Hashem wants us. The reality is Hashem says, oh, that's what you want? <laughs> I'm not going to give it to you. You want to learn Torah? I'm going to put all the distractions in your life that you don't have time to learn Torah, that when you get half an hour free, you will cherish that half an hour. And you're going to use that half an hour every second of it. And that half an hour will be intense like five hours. Now let me see you finding time to learn Torah. A lot of people think I learn Torah from the morning till night. Alevai, I would do that. I have seven kids to take care of. You know what's taking care of seven kids? All under the age of 19? I mean, Baruch Hashem, I have a wife. But I am half the day taking care of my family. It doesn't matter in, which, in, in what respect. That in itself is a, a, a responsibility. And life itself and a million and one things. I told you already, Shem has a fair amount of challenges he sends to my directions. As the Mishnah, uh, the, the, sorry, the Gemara says, Kechol Shekoho Gover, Kach Yitzrong Gover. The more you grow in your spiritual power, the opponent, the opponent that will come to you is in the same level. So don't think I'm licking honey all day long. All day long I'm dealing with challenges and big challenges and many challenges. But I see in the Naaseh the Nishma, the Nishma I hear. What are you doing? What's the Naaseh? What are you doing? Now I'm giving you an example with uh, I want to learn Torah. Hashem says uh, I'll put challenges in your life. You also want to go to a Torah class. You also want to do some chesed and volunteer. But you have a job. And then you have to come home. You have to take care of your kids. You have to feed your, the, the, the family. And then all the challenges that come with that. Who has the head to go to a Torah class? Most people don't have the basic focus on anything that has to do with Torah just because their mind is occupied with all the challenges. And when I'm saying challenges, it can be financial issues, it can be health issues, it can be problems with your kids, spouse, any challenge you go through. We all have 50 challenges at the same time that you deal with. And every challenge holds in it 50, one, 50 challenges. You don't have money. You're broke. You finally got a few dollars. You go to the supermarket. You buy whatever you need. As you're standing in line, somebody pushes you and half one falls on the floor and breaks. I'm, I'm, I, I finally got some money. To, are you breaking that? And then you lose your temper on that person who pushed you. And, and all day long, you're dealing with situations. Where's time for a shame? So, so we can continue and conclude. To overanalyze things is no point. I like taking my uh, signs from what I see, and I clearly see another big sign that the redemption is coming closer. It's another uh, reassurance. Most people, they know how to get home from their place of work. Or they know how to drive to their friend or to their uh, business or whatever. But they still put the GPS on. 
Now I understand you want to see traffic, uh, uh, notifications if there's a uh, accident or something. But the reality is that by default, a person goes into the car and puts in the, in the, the GPS. Subconsciously needs the reassurance I'm on the right road, I'm on the right way. And even if I don't drive with a GPS, I constantly look where I am to make sure. You constantly need a reassurance you're on the right path. So Shem is giving us reassurance we're not only on the right path, we're, we're, we're the only path. Most people don't believe the redemption can happen tomorrow. And I think that's why the, we don't have the redemption, because most people don't really believe it can actually happen. They don't picture themselves in the time of the redemption. Can you picture yourself in the time of the redemption? So. It says in the book of Zechariah, Hashem will transform or will switch all the fast days, the fast of the fourth, the fast, it doesn't say it like that, it says the fourth fast, the fifth fast, the ninth fast, and the tenth fast will be transformed to sason and simcha, to joy and happiness and a great occasion. Saying in other words that Mashiach can come in a blink of an eye. We're right now in a situation that at any given moment, at any given moment, Mashiach can come, whether it can, let's take the best case scenario with tons of mercy and, uh, and kindness, and worst case scenario with a huge war. Either way, Mashiach is coming. We don't need more reassurance than that. It's every step of the way. Hashem is telling us, it's you one st step closer. Now comes the million dollar question. Are you ready for the coming of Mashiach? My uh, perception is that most people are not ready. If you want to ask why, I'll answer. Because they're not. They're still sinning. Most people still sin a lot. Now, sinning is one thing. We all sin. Is how do you deal with the sins? Do you control it? Do you minimize it? Do you do tshuva? Do you make amends? The reality right now is that the world is in a chaotic state. This is, uh, you can call it chaotic state. I call it the darkness of exile. This is choshech agalut. And you see, it's becoming stronger and stronger and more condensed and more intense. And the challenges that everybody's going through are becoming harder and harder. And every, everything is becoming intensified and more and more. Now, everybody's waiting for a break. Let me be the one who tells you there won't be any breaks. This is from here just going to accelerate. It's not, it's not that you're going to have a break now. Hashem is now a, 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 a switch. Not only switch the gear, the time is going even faster. I failed to meet one person in this world to disagree with the fact that time is going faster. It's unbelievable. I mean, I still have the smell of the besamim of Avdalah. I'm not joking with you. It's Wednesday. It's Wednesday. It, this is, doesn't make, it's not normal. In two days is Shabbat. We just finished our Shabbat. You know that my Shabbat clothes are still on the way I hang it next to my bed. Everybody feels and experiences that Hashem, like in WhatsApp, that you do times two. I hear my wife listening to messages like that. I'm like, how can, I don't understand. How do you understand? But she puts the times two. Uh, same with me. You know that somebody did that to one of my videos and then edited it and cut it on a little piece and put it on, on, on uh, social media. Like a three minute reel. But he, he did it on like 300% uh, the speed. So I'm like, a, I'm like Donald Duck on, on steroids. <laughs> At least give me a little bit of respect and put it in the right speed. <laughs> Making me sound like uh, Donald Duck on cocaine. Anyways. Uh, 
I lost my chain of thought. The fact is that the pressure of the, the exile is becoming stronger. It doesn't matter how you're going to look at it. The Kadosh Bokho, I already told you, he's laying down the ground with all the, the, uh, 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 the soldiers in the right position. He's preparing everything like a real smart military general with moving everything. You just need to follow what he's doing. The Kadosh Buhu is already uh, exposing to us that that's it. I'm coming to bring the Geula. The time has come. Anavim, Anavim. Higia Gzman Gulatchem. For thousands of years we're waiting for it. Finally it's coming. Everybody's freaking out. Now it's the time of the Geula. Fasten your seatbelts. It's going to become very bumpy. This is not bumpy. What you're seeing now, it's not even the beginning. So Kadosh Buhu is already telling us, listen, I have created the system. I'm giving you all the signs, whether it's from uh, Iran, whether it's from America, it doesn't matter. And you have to understand that Israel is the center of the entire world. This class is not for the Jews who live in Eretz Israel. It's for the entire world who don't live in Eretz Israel, Jews and non-Jews. If you think we're, we're, we're eating it, <laughs> Israel is just the beginning. Israel is the eye of the storm, which means the storm starts in Israel. That's why you see now stormy weather in Israel. But once the storm takes off and starts spinning and affecting the entire world, Israel is going to be the eye of the storm. The only safe place to be. I quoted already the Noam Elimelech. I told you. The Noam Elimelech said, before the coming of Mashiach, it's going to be very, very Scary and dangerous in Israel. But shortly after it will spread to the entire world and Israel will be the only and the most safe place in the world. So if we see Israel now going through whatever it's going to, get ready. In a theater next, near you, it's going to leave Israel. Gog and Magog is next to Israel, not in Israel. If we do what we need to do, we're not going to suffer anything. The war is going to be on the enemies and nothing's going to happen here. The problem is that till everybody will get their act together, we are going to experience a lot of loss of life, as we see every day. A lot of problems. The problems come not only in Israel, all over the world. If you're a Jew, then you're going to have a problem wherever you are. Jews have no other place. Um, uh, uh, Starting a little bit of the Jews around the world to figure it out. And still didn't figure it out. That the only place to be is in Eretz Israel. Whether it takes you a year or four years to get here, that's the purpose. And if you're a Gentile that lives outside of Israel and, you know, and you're not necessarily in the position to come to Israel, what do you think? That's not going to be affected? Everything that is happening right now is globally. It's not for the nation of Israel. The nation of Israel is one pixel out of the entire picture. The redemption is for everybody. Everybody is included in that. You choose very wisely who you stand with. Now, if I need to now summarize everything, because I have a lot more to say and I want to summarize it because we're already in two hours and 15 minutes. The Kadosh Bukhu is showing to us the promo of the video of the movie like you're about to see a movie it's coming out with your favorite actors you get to see the promo and the release date is whatever why they do that why does hollywood uh, do that just take out the movie why you tell me the movie's going to come out in december 12th the movie's ready last year already why do i have to wait for that for that date well they want to build up the uh, the build, uh, how, uh, how is it called? Hmm? To hype it up, but there's a, there's a word to that, that to build up uh, the anticipation and the, oh, the that's it. It's very simple. And, 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 and Hollywood does it with movies, cars do it with models. The new Mercedes, the 2025 Mercedes. There's no such a car, it's a concept. But they're keeping it. Oh, the new, the new model is coming out. And it's with everything. Cars, fashion, clothes, phones. 
Why don't you create one time a good iPhone that will last for 20 years? No, every half a year I have to come out with a new iPhone because what are you going to buy if, I, if it's the same thing? So nobody invented anything. That's Hashem's approach. Hashem is now showing you everything. He's giving promos. And he's saying, shortly in a city near you. I gave you a pretty uh, clear uh, uh, explanation of what we see with our own eyes. Now, the, 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 the bottom line is, what do you do with that? And again, I told you, I could have looked more, searched more, find more, and I would. But at this point, there's no time. I told you, the time is doubling now. There's no time to waste. Everything has to be done at the right time and fast. So Shem is writing on the wall to us, I am about to bring destruction on this world. You can look at it in a negative way. I see it in a positive way. When I want to build a new house on a land that is a very old, run-down uh, shed is on that, I need to destroy the previous structure so I can build a new structure. Has to be destruction before Mashiach comes. I explained that in the uh, video, in the class that I gave six, seven, eight years ago, Mashiach is coming, I, Mashiach is coming are you ready? Where I have explained specifically that. Go and watch the video, I'm not going to continue. But Hashem is already telling us what He's going to do. Exactly how He told Paro and Moshe. And the, Hashem says, I'm telling you what I'm going to do. Why didn't Hashem take the Israelites, the Bnei Israel out of Mitzrayim in one second? What's the big deal? You need to start now bringing frogs and hell and all this uh, drama and the production. Just go like that and get them out of Mitzrayim. You would look like a much greater uh, God. Moshe Rabbein was questioning Hashem. Why do you need all these plagues? So they will see that I am the God. That's it. That's what Hashem is doing. That everybody will see that He is the God. Now Hashem is going to come and throw punches to all directions. My suggestions, find a good place to, to, to hide. Now the punches, it's not I'm, I'm visualizing it different. Hashem is going to come as a whole. If it's the whole nation of Israel, the whole nation of Israel will get their slap to their face. If it's a city, if it's a congregation, you want to be away from the line of fire. You want to make sure that you are good with the Kadosh Baruch Hu, that you are going to be cocooned and safe to pass through this passage of the birth pain of the coming of Mashiach. Because it's what you feel now. I wish I had a way to do that. Some of you are bright enough to, to, to get what I'm about to say in a second. Try in your mind to meditate and go back five years and how did the world look five years ago? And you by yourself will understand and you see how everything intensified in the world and in your own life. Time stand. If we would have some way to go back now five years, world was completely different. Five years and now. So Hashem is paving the way and He's telling you straight out, you either with me or you without me. It's my way or the highway. No more games, no more nonsense. You do what I tell you, you're with me. And you're going to be okay. Nothing's going to affect you. You want to go against me? That's how I started the, the, the class. The whole point is that Kadosh Bukhu wants to make a point. I am the boss. Till humanity will reach to that understanding, it will suffer tremendously. Till the world will understand that, it will suffer tremendously. That's the only goal. That's what Hashem is doing. The sooner you figure it out, and the sooner you disconnect yourself from any type of heresy, then you, I would say, you, you, you're good to go. Now, does that mean you're safe? You don't have to go run to the bomb shelter when the missiles are coming? I didn't say that. You are still under danger. But at least you know that you're good with Hashem. You're still going to have challenges. There'll be less, but you'll have challenges. Because Hashem wants you on your own right now. That's it. Hashem now, He says, I took off the, how do you call those wheels that you put in the back? 
the training wheels and he pushes it. He says, go. No more help. Do it yourself. You, you have to narrow your focus on this concept. Everything else will ta be taken care of. You have to understand we're rushing like a train with no brakes on a railroad that is just accelerating. If you're not going to equip yourself with the right tools, you won't survive it. You'll crash from the impact because Hashem has now no mercy. It's all judgments. There's no rachamim involved here. I'm sure you see that. It's just dinim, gvurot, judgments. And don't interpret that or say Hashem is bad, mean. Or, this has nothing to do with that. Hashem says, you didn't get it the nice way. I have to do it. There's no time. I have to do it the not nice way. So take all that. Watch the video now 500 more times to understand the concept. A, where are we going? We're going to the, to the only destination, coming of Mashiach. You cannot reverse it. You cannot delay it. And we can hasten it. Right now, it seems the mad train is going in forces only of the name of judgments. That's how it seems. But you still see a little rachamim in between the lines. We can add, we can change our acts and add to the amount of rachamim, of mercy. But that's where we're heading to. Like a car heading into a wall with no brakes. Now what do you do? You sit in the car waiting for the airbag to go on your face. Or you jump out of the car. What do you do? You know what I do? I press the brakes. That's it. Pressing the brakes. You need to focus on what's going on. You need to understand the messages Hashem is giving us. It's auto to it's, it's imminent. It's any second. And I know, when I'm saying any second, it could be another, another five years. But... Sometimes takes maneuvers how to maneuver everything. Hashem this time is not going to come with a flood. The flood started and within hours the world was underwater. That Hashem is not going to do anymore. He says, I will never destroy the world with a flood. I will do other things. Now Hashem wants us to graduate the test with flying colors. And He tells you, I am not backing you up. I am not supporting you. I am not helping you. I am going to make it worse on you. Because I want you to be the best. You need to work on yourself. You need to practice. You have it in you. But I'm not giving you any assistance. You're on your own. That's what Hashem is telling us. You are on your own. You had me for 2,000 years. Now, don't get me wrong. Hashem is not leaving us. Or deserting us. And when I'm saying us, I'm talking humans. Not Jews. Okay? When I'm saying us. Humans, Jews and non-Jews, there's the differences, but I'm talking now as a human race. We're all children of Hashem. But at this point, then I can relate with that. I can relate with that. I have two groups of kids, older ones and young ones. The older ones are three, four that are old, and then the young ones, there's a kind of a break in between. So I'm dealing with little kids and wiping... A Tuchuses with the, uh, doesn't matter. Uh, I still wipe Tuchuses. I have a little kid. And I have a 20 year old. So I'm, I'm dealing with kids in all ages. And I see how myself, how I deal with the young ones. And how I deal with the older ones. The young ones, soft and tender and nice. And everything is, you know, invested in colors and... Uh, I want to teach my four-year-old to say brachot, everything is... It's a totally different attitude how I want to educate my kid. I also understand that my four-year-old or my nine-year-old, they don't have the comprehension or the common sense or any intelligence to understand if I talk to them directly. I have to talk to them like a four-year-old. But when it comes to the older ones, you're already 18. I don't need to... How I deal with my older ones is like that. When I'm saying like that, quick. No, no, I don't have to put on a show, on an act, to lie on the floor. That's how I deal, deal with kids. With my 18-year-old? You're a man. 
the rebuke or the tochecha is four seconds. That's it. And the attitude, you're an adult. I see that how I am with my kids. I see how Hashem is with us. And Hashem doesn't tell us, I don't like you. Or you sin a lot and I'm not going to help you. He just says, you've been around enough. Now it's time to do it by yourself. And you have no support for me. And you know what? That's how you make things happen. When I was a kid, I, I, uh, I'm just trying to give an example. I'm not talking bad about my, my, my parents. We were, Baruch Hashem, financially very, doing very well. All my friends always got motorbikes and cars and presents and everything because I lived in a rich neighborhood. And me, every time I would come to ask my father for something, go and work. And in my mind, I was like, you have money. Why can't you buy me a motorbike? Why can't you buy me a car? Why can't you buy me this? My friends, they're all... Have... I didn't like that. I resented that when I was a teenager. That was the answer. Go and work. I'll be nice with you. You want a job? I'll give you a job. So in my childhood, I resented that. In my teenagehood, I hated that. But in my 20s, when I went and did everything by myself with great success, I went and thanked my father for teaching me how to do it myself. I can give now a person every day. You, have, you, you, have, you don't have money? Come, I'll give you money every day. Knock on my door, I'll give you money. To buy food. Am I doing any justice with you? No, I'm not doing anything with you. The justice will be, and I'm not giving you food anymore. Come and work for me. That's it, come and work. Or go and do that business. I'll help you do a business. I'll help you invest in a business. I'll help you take off. But uh, as the story tale says, what is better, to give somebody a meal or to teach him how to get the meal? Fish, the fish. So my father taught me all my life, go get it yourself. And I told you, for 20 years I resented him, I resented the con, I didn't like that. A decade later, I was beyond appreciative to the, to the, to the way how I was educated, that's what I do with my kids. You want something? Go get it yourself. Don't depend on anyone, don't count on anyone. Don't think anyone will come to your help and don't depend on me. What if I don't have? I was taught you depend on Hashem and you do what you need to do and if Hashem wants to send you assistance from others, He'll send it to you. I'll tell you one quick story, the conclusion, then we can finish. When I was 15, I was a, a little bit of a, a little bit of a, I don't know how to call it, bad boy. So when I was 15, I used to steal my mother's car every night. She had a beautiful sports car. And I used to open the garage door quietly, put the car in neutral, push the car down the driveway all the way out to the street. And I had to do it because it was an uh, Alfa Romeo. It had a strong engine. I would start the engine with like a... And I would push the car down to the street, start and take off. Go pick up my friends and we would drive all night. 15-year-olds. In Israel, you have to be 17 to drive. This went on for about half a year. Every night, I would take the car out, pick up my friends, we'd go hang out. Such uh, irresponsibility, I would drink, I would drive drunk, 15 year old, without license. So, one night we were drunk, drinking and driving. Uh, we drove far away, me and two friends. Then, I don't know what, I don't remember, I made a U-turn. As I went like this, the, the motion was like this, I had a cigarette in my mouth and my hand threw the cigarette uh, off, out of my mouth. Uh, and what was the result? I went like this. The car went into the maiden. So the tire exploded. Okay. We stopped the car in the middle of the highway. We start uh, replacing the flat tire. Who comes to help us? Cops. My third friend in the back, he's like making all of his number one, number two in his pants in the back. And me and my other friend are cool like ice. And we're talking with a cop. He's helping us. Thank you. And we get into the car, my friend who was scared, he's like, take me home, I can't, oh, we drop him home, my other friend and me continue drinking, and then at some point they took off. Now, the cops, the undercover cops in the city where I lived, they, they, 
they started recognizing me, and every time they would see me, and I would take off and disappear. So that night, I come and I face them face to face. So starts a pursuit, and I start driving like a maniac, 15 years old, without a license, and drunk. And I'm, uh, uh, what's the word? I don't know the word. I'm making a joke out of them. I'm like with a fast car, so I disappeared, of course. And what did I do? I went down this long road, and the road has, had the, these cul-de-sacs where like houses were in. So I went into one of them, went all the way in, stopped the car. I went with a chair like, you know, like that, and I lie down, put the mirror like this so I can see them, and I'm hiding, and I see the police guards going, and I'm laughing, and... And then, you have to imagine, I'm like in this one-way street, all the way at the end, like this, and the police car is going up, and, and I see them. And suddenly I see the police car stops, goes back, and turns in, and comes right to my car. Knocks on the window, I open up, license and registration, I says, I don't have. ID, I don't have. Long story short, of course, they arrest me, and... Uh, they wanted to charge me with whatever you can just think of. Stealing a car, driving without a license, no insurance, driving under alcohol. You can't, they wanted to, I was about to get in big trouble. To make a long story short, I, uh, I uh, met a certain individual uh, who, who uh, later on became really my, uh, how do you call it? Not a sponsor. For sure a mentor. He was uh, an adult. But uh, if he wouldn't uh, take me under his wing at that time when I was 15, I would uh, probably be either dead or in jail now. I would be completely off the charts. He held me close. Very special individual. Uh, and I worked for him for many years. I mean, we, we, we were very, we, he died, unfortunately, a few years ago, but we were very close. Yeah, for sure, mentor. He was like my uh, uh, hero, my savior. I mean, hey. Anyways, why am I saying all this? So he saved me from this whole situation. And I was supposed to get in a lot of trouble. I mean, I stole my parents' car and driving uh, drunk and so many things. I was supposed to get, they wanted to take my license for like 10 years and jail and juvie and whatever. Now what happened, my father punished me, <laughs> punished, punished me. Uh, when I came to the age of 17, uh, when my sisters were older, uh, he paid for their driver's license. When it came, when I was 17, he's like, I'm, I'm, I'm never, I'm not paying for anything. Okay, came 17, all my friends because started getting driver's license but me. So I went the entire summer, instead of having fun with my friends, I, the entire summer I worked, nobody knew I'm working. I saved the money, went and did the driver's lessons, made, get, got the license by myself, and I called my father, uh, and I tell him, uh, can you add me to the car insurance? He's like, what? I told him, can you add me to the car insurance? I did a driving test today, and I got my driver's license. He was shocked, shocked. Then I called my mom and I was like, uh, do you need the car? Uh, I want to take the car for a ride. She screamed at me, what? How dare you? You didn't learn anything. And she's giving me a home mishaberach. And I'm like, I got a license today. So what's the moral of the story? Don't steal your mother's car. The moral of the story is that I understood when I was 17 that no one, including my father, who I depended on, was coming to do anything for me. And I understood, you want this driver's license? You get it. All my friends used to go every day to the beach, and I used to go and work. Hot, sweaty. I'm not complaining. I love my job. I'm not, I never complain. I'm not the type that complains. I'm just telling you. Instead of going in and enjoying the summer, I went and worked. And I especially did it quiet that nobody knows that I can come to my father that I disappointed 50 million times and tell him I did it myself. I don't need you. He was so happy and so proud and so overwhelmed with joy. Both my parents. It's the first time that I came and showed them 
some responsibility, some uh, 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 action taken after a lesson learned. Now, I don't need my parents to be proud. I did needed that to set, like I told you in the beginning of the lectures, if you don't have boundaries and definitions, everything will be chaos. This is the first act in my life that I took responsibility for my actions and I went and initiated something that is hard and I did it myself. And why is this story so important to me to share with? Because God wants you now the exact same thing and he's going to push you to all the corners that you can't seem to get out of because he's saying to you, I want you to do it yourself. I want you to do something without having to trust no one and even myself. And therefore, every, I see everything connected in such a, high, such a beautiful way. Not that I'm chas v'shalom saying in a negative way, but when I saw the videos with the assassination, the attempt of the assassination, I was like, give me a day or two, I'll figure out the message here. But this is an amazing message. This is not a regular event. This is not a regular event. Obviously, Hashem didn't want Trump to die. Take from it for more, whatever you want to take from that. I take from that that Trump is and probably will be the leader of Edom to give the crown to Melech HaMashiach. Listen, there's a video that the Lubavitch Rebbe says that to Bibi. Right? You saw the video. I'm sure you saw the video that Lubavitch Rebbe is saying to Bibi, you're going to give Mashiach the keys to the government. To the country. Listen, such a, a statement from a tzaddik. But maybe, maybe we'll, uh, how do you see? We'll see very soon. The point that we want to do, and now I'm going to give you a few things to, to focus on, is that if you haven't figured it out yet, the world is already in such a kvetch before the coming of Mashiach. This is the birth pains of Mashiach, and it's just the beginning. So that's the first thing you need to take to consideration. Second thing, you have to understand that every step on the way here, Hashem is giving you just signs. Now, do I need these signs? I need these signs to understand or to get the reassurance that there's only one God that controls the world. And you can be religious from here till tomorrow. I was dealing now with a certain situation, with a certain individual, that was dealing with health issues. If there's a doctor in the world that person didn't go to, um, don't call me alone. That person turned the whole world around. Doctors, checkups. And that person is very observant. Extremely observant. And the whole time I was, you know, it's, it's important to do physical checkups to figure out what's the problem, but it seems like you're missing the point. Eight, nine months down the line now, that person finally got it and understood. That person told me, I understood. I understood that I was, in a very refined way, a heretic. Instead of trusting that Hashem will heal me and praying to Hashem and putting all my trust in Hashem, I run all around the world to doctors. Sorry I made you scared with that. Why are you running all around the world to doctors? and finding this method, and that method, and this cure, and that cure, and this cure. I'm not saying don't look for a solution. This is your hishtadlut. You have to make some effort. But to put all your trust that this doctor will solve the problem, I'm sorry to tell you, I don't care how religious you are, how much you believe in God, that's, I won't call it heresy not to offend you, but you don't trust in Hashem. As religious and observant as you are. And that person realized that first time, came to me today, told me, I figured out the problem. I didn't trust Hashem. Enough. I didn't put my hope and my trust and my prayers into Hashem. That's it. And that's the problem, by, my, by the way, for all of us. All of us has this problem. Hashem is going to push you, push you, push you. You know why He's pushing you? He wants to see if you're going to cross the line that you stop believing in Him. Or you lose trust in Him. Everybody has that line, by the way. So Hashem now, in a, I don't know if to say cruel way, 
but he's pushing you and pushing you and putting all the pressure he can on you. He knows what's the pressure that you can handle. For one person is being lonely, not having the, their uh, a wife or a husband. Another person is financial. Another person health. Another person 50 other million things. Hashem knows what bothers you. He knows where to put all the pressure. And everybody's being pressured. And it's the love of Hashem. Because he's telling you, A, that's your problem. Wake up. Change it. B, sorry to tell you. <laughs> I gave you 20, 30 years to do it with me holding your hand. Now no hands. Do it yourself. But really, that's the way to do it. And that's how I was taught everything in my life. I was taught to swim. The swimming teacher threw me into the water. That's it. Figure it out. <gasps> what do you mean figure it out? I'm drowning. Figure it out. That's most of my, how I learn things in this life is figured out. No, I guess I'll figure it out. So Hashem is telling us, figure it out. Okay, now for a little bit of advice. First of all, like I told you, uh, today is a very powerful night to pray. Take that night. I posted on my website at smooth.org, uh, 16 of Tammuz. That's the URL. You'll find the prayers you need to recite. Pray, uh, use that day. It's a very, very powerful day. And needless to say, Yudzayin Betamuz, Nachon, it's a fast day. When I first became observant, people used to tell me, have a meaningful fast. I was like, well, what's going to be meaningful about me being starving? There's nothing meaningful about me being starving. It took me 15 years to understand that the meaningful is what do you take out of the fast? Do you take some type of a lesson out of this day that you suffered because you didn't eat for 12 hours? The fast is not for you to be tortured. The fast is for you to think forward. Most people think that the fast is to look backwards. What did we do? Oh, so we need to fast. The fast is look forward. What did you do? Now change it. Why are we fasting? Destruction of the temple. What do you need to do to change it? If you don't change, then what, what are you fasting for? So tomorrow you need to focus on what brought us to the destruction of the temple and everything that happened in Zion Bet Tammuz. Do I have responsibility in it? Yes. Can I do something? Yes. Should I do something? Of course. Then get to do it. Donald Trump took a bullet to his ear for you to understand Shana Seven Ishma. Action! I told you that a million times. That's what the Talmud says. Sorry, the Mishnah. When is your uh, learning, your studying valuable? When you know how to apply it into action. Okay. I told you throughout the time there are many, many things that one needs to do uh, to be in the redemption program. Don't lie, don't cheat, no slandering, etc., 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 and many other things. I don't go back with anything that I said. But I want to add one more thing, which you know. But really, that's our power. <clears throat> it says in the Talmud, Tractate Kiddushim, page 40b. Le'olam yirei adam et atzmo ke'ilu chetzio hayav vechetzio zakai. A person should always look at yourself like you are 50-50. Half of you, 50%, you're zakai meaning you're doing great, and half of it is you're doing bad. You chayav. 50, 50. Don't hold yourself that I'm 80-20. 50-50. And uh, it continues in the Talmud. It says, achat, You did one mitzvah. You should be proud and happy of yourself that you tilted your, uh, your uh, scale to the positive side. But on the other hand, you made one sin, you should be very careful because you just put yourself on the scale on the side of negativity. Rabbi Lazar, the son of Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai, says, Ha'erulam nidon acharubo, ve'hayachid nidon acharubo. The world is being judged according to its majority, and the same thing, the personal person. Goes by the majority. If you do one mitzvah, he says, Ashrav shichriyat asmo v'kolam, lekav zchut. So one mitzvah, you can tilt your, your and the entire world scale to be looked upon favorably. One mitzvah. 
And this is said by Rabbi Shimon, by, by Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai's sons, Rabbi Elazar. This is not some, uh, some uh, a quote from Hallmark. So, if one mitzvah, according to the Talmud, I can tilt the entire world to kafzchut, to a favorable side, then there's another mitzvah that will be probably much more than that, no? Now, if I'm talking about a mitzvah, what would be much more powerful than that, than a mitzvah? The Talmud Torah keneged kulam. And learning Torah is more powerful than all the mitzvahs together. Not one on one. Put all the mitzvahs on one side and the Torah, learning Torah on one side, the Torah is more powerful. So we have here the Talmud says that you do a mitzvah and you tilt the world or yourself to kavzchut, to a favorable side. Anachat kama vekama, so much more so is learning Torah. In uh, Tractate Megillah, page 16a, when Haman Harasha figured out that he's about to lose his uh, game, he figured out, Hashavarosh already told him, get out. He figured out the story's over. So he went to uh, 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 yeshiva and he wanted to see what they're doing there. He understood that they won, the Jews won. And he came in and he told them, what, what are you uh, doing right now? They said, we're learning. What are you learning? They said, we are learning the dinim, the judgments, the laws of a kmitza. Kmitza is when you, it's a measurement that uh, at the time of the offering in the Bet HaMikdash, the Kohen would put his hand, whether it, let's say, it would be barley, wheat, then it would be in the size of a hand. Okay, that's called kmitza. So they were uh, 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 learning the laws of what's called minchat ha'omer, the offering of the omer. I'm sure you know, familiar, I'm not going to explain right now. Haman HaRasha told them this mitzvah, this little mitzvah, komets also means small. In Hebrew, it's not slang, it's actually proper, it's actually proper Hebrew, but if you want to say in a small dose, you would say komets, because it's small. You just do a little bit with your hand. Haman says, this little mitzvah of comets, of comets, of minchat omer, the offering of the omer, was standing to you as a merit that is more powerful than the 10,000 silver coins that I got from Achashverosh. You remember that Achashverosh says, what do you want? He says, I want 10,000 silver coins, which is probably equivalent to now 400 million dollars, something like that. So he says, your little mitzvah of holding like kernels of uh, wheat, that little mitzvah stood to your entire nation as a merit to save you from annihilation. And to me, that little, little kmitza is worth more than the 10,000 silver coins. Now for you, you're saying 10,000 silver coins, you're imagining like a little bag. I'm telling you, it's about, if, it would, if we would uh, compare it, it's like now getting $100 million. Uh, maybe I'm wrong with it, uh, but it's something big. It's like me, and now uh, somebody comes and gives you $100 million to go and do something. You will t take that $100 million very fast. Unless you're a normal person, you'll be like, thank you very much. And uh, know that you're going to be robbed down the road by, uh, by uh, robbers from the $100 million. So anyways, you're not going to get it. Better not to do the, the crime they ask you to do. But Haman Rasha figured it out. The Zohar says in the Hakdama, Hakdama Dalet, page 2, Da kol mande, kol mande, dishtadel beoraita, la dachil mi ilaye mitatei. Any person that is busy learning Torah uh, uh, is never going to be afraid of any mazik and nothing can touch him. The mazikim, uh, the, one, the entities that are coming, like, like it sounds, mazikim means to, to do harm. Lehazik uh, is to do harm. Mazikim is the ones who are doing harm. Whether it's a spirit, a soul, a, a person, it doesn't matter. But the Zohar says, if you are constantly busy with the Torah, nothing can touch you. So I don't understand why the majority of the world who is observant doesn't do uh, enough of that. 
So you want nishma, uh, something in action? How many hours a day do you learn Torah? If you learn Torah. So not everyone has the ability to learn Torah. Not so easy. Some things are difficult. You need the language. You need to understand. But many things you can uh, do that is considered learning Torah. And you, and you don't have to be such a scholar. You read Tehillim. That's learning Torah. According to the Torah, even it's more than that. When David HaMelech finished writing the compiling, the, the, the book of Tehillim, because he didn't write the whole uh, chapter, all, the whole 150 chapters. There are 10 different individuals who wrote the entire Tehillim. David HaMelech just wrote the majority and put it together. But when he finished compiling the Tehillim, his prayer was that any person that would read this book would be considered like as if he's learning Torah in the highest level of Torah learning, which is called Dinei Mamonot. The laws of uh, finance and money between people. And the Torah, this is considered the hardest tractate of laws. You know, a good rabbi, who becomes later on a judge, that's like 40 lawyers. And learning in yeshiva, I always laugh, I have a friend who's a lawyer, and he's like uh, pretentious, I'm a lawyer, I told him, listen, any student, yeshiva student, is four lawyers. What you learn in law school, that's one class of mara. What do you think mara is? What do you think the oral law is? It's all law. It's law. So, uh, what one needs to take to consideration, female, uh, male, and in many situations, Jews, non-Jews. Certain things the non-Jews are not allowed to learn from the Torah, but many things they're allowed to learn. And the, the things that the non-Jews are allowed to learn, when they learn that, is considered for them learning Torah. So it's not only the Jews here. It has nothing to do, you know how I talk. It is no, I don't separate in these talks Jews and non-Jews. It's aimed to everybody. And the same way that the Jews need to repent and go in the path of, the, of, uh, of Hashem, non-Jews too. Why do you think the 7 billion people are exempt? They just might know on which path they're going, but they're not exempt. That's up to us to, to lead it the right way. So what I want to come to conclude and to suggest, first of all, take a break tonight after the class. Go to atzmud.com, atzmud.org, forward slash 16 of Tammuz. You'll find the prayers there. Re recite the prayers. Light a candle for Boaz. Give some charity. Follow the instructions. And ask Hashem to make order in your mind that your mind is uh, organized, that you are clearly see what's going on. You clearly see what's evil. You clearly see what's good. You understand the, the structure of what's going on. And pray from the bottom of your heart that Hashem is going to awaken up in your heart the connection to Him, that chas shalom, not in any situation that you should come to a doubt that you're not trusting Hashem in anything. And I'm telling you that as, as, as a side note in parentheses, that I'm not saying that to hurt you, I'm saying that to, to affect you and hopefully to wake you up. You all, if pushed too much, lose the trust in Hashem. That's how it works. And when I'm saying you, I include me in it. Hashem is also challenging me with challenges that you can't even imagine. Now, I will never doubt in Hashem. I will never leave Hashem. But when some situations are heavier than what you can carry, you cave under the pressure. And then you have thoughts. Hear who? A thought. A little bit angry at Hashem, or maybe that person. And that's a test. A test is Hashem is testing you now how much you trust Him. Hashem is testing if you have a little bit of filth of heresy or idolatry. And if you do, He's not going to let go. He's going to keep on smacking you. Because very soon, Hashem is going to lift up the veil. I don't know if He's going to do, ta-da! I don't think He's going to do, ta-da! But that's when everybody's eyes are going to open and realize, okay... I don't want to use the wrong words, but that day I'm talking about, I don't know if necessarily the day Mashiach is coming, but that's the day Hashem is going to decide to reveal what's going on, and in this day, there won't be any other option but to bow down. Every, 
כל לשון, read the Alenu Shabbach that we read every day. That's what's going to happen. You want to understand what, where Hashem is taking us? Read the Alenu Shabbach. You understand what Hashem is telling us, what He's going to do. So Hashem is so kind, so merciful, so patient, so understanding, so giving. And we have the chutzpah to complain. And Hashem is telling us day after day, do tshuva, get on the right path, stop lying, stop cheating, stop slandering, don't be judgmental, don't hate. Do charity, learn Torah, do good. I'm giving you another day, and another day, and another missile, and another jet, and another okay, this, and another. It's going to run out. Th- these opportunities are going to run out. Because right now, Hashem is telling us when the is going to start, it's going to start from the north. When it starts from the north, no, there's no turning back. That's it. That's what I'm telling you. What you see now is nothing. And I'm not minimizing the people who gave their lives and the people who were murdered and the soldiers who were giving up their lives and risking their lives. They didn't die for vain, but I'm just saying this is nothing. And what do we need to do instead of being now under pressure and chas v'shalom lose our patience or, our, or anything else is to focus ourselves. You have to take tonight because it's a powerful night. And why tonight? Because tonight, mystically, something shifted in the universe for the preparation of the birth of Mashiach by the unity of Ruth and Boaz, who weren't even meant fit according to the Torah. Ruth was not supposed to even come to this uh, 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 situation. So tonight is me'ain, like kind of the, 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 the birth of the idea of the dynasty of Mashiach. Which means that tonight you, we can hook into that source and, 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 and uh, nourish it to me that I would live in a level that I'm uh, going to add now something. Like I keep telling you, a thousand will fall from here, ten thousand will fall from here. What I add to this verse, that it won't even affect you. Not it won't come to you. It won't affect you. That you're going to see what's going to happen in the world. Most people just from the sorrow, I think, will die seeing it. You have to pray to Hashem. I want to be in the level that I'm ready to receive the light of Mashiach. The coming of Mashiach. Now is the perfect time to do the change. And then you take the Yudzayin of Temuz, the day that signifies destruction. The first thing that Yudzayin Temuz signifies is the destruction of the tablets... As a result of the golden calf. Go back to the reference what I told you. That's the motion of the klipa. You have to understand. Bilam, Balak. All these, it's klipot. They, they, it was a person that the person is a manifestation of a spiritual entity. That here it's manifested in, into the person. And when it's not in the person, the spiritual entity exists. So there's klipat Amalek. There's klipat Midian. There's klipat Moab. There's all these klipot. So I need to understand at this point that the Kadosh Bukhu is already lining everything up. That I need to ask myself, am I ready? My nature in my personality was to leave everything till the last minute. That was my personality. I have learned the hard way. Do everything today, what you, do today what you can do today and don't, don't push it till tomorrow. And now when I apply that, life is completely different. Hashem is telling you the same thing. Why are you waiting for the last minute? What are you waiting for? Are you waiting for the nuclear bomb to fall somewhere to wake up? Are you waiting for what? Another October 7? What are you waiting for? To get your act together. To wake up. It's all for us. Hashem is doing all this because He says, that's it. You're not in kindergarten anymore. You're in high school. You do it yourself. That's the level that we received. And you know what? It's the best level ever. Can you imagine how we're going to feel when Mashiach is going to come and we can tap ourselves on the back and say, I fought my Yetzirah every day. Every day I fought my Yetzirah and I fell. Twice a week, ten times a week. I never gave up. And I learned Torah. And I did mitzvot. And I observed Shabbat. You know what's going to happen? Mashiach is going to come to you. 
Well, if you're a woman, maybe not, but if you're a man, he'll shake your hand. Thank you. Thank you for, for, for making me come faster. So we have an opportunity because Yudzain Betamuz is a turning point where we can uh, uh, use that. It's a negative day that can birth very positive things. I spoke about it in previous classes of Yudzain Betamuz. Go and look at it on YouTube if you want. But Yudzain Betamuz is a day that if you decide to say, stay in your sorrow and sink in your sadness, okay, right. like, like I told you before, that's what you want. Go ahead, do, do whatever you want. But if uh, you think somebody's going to come and help you, I'm telling you, you can believe me or not, you can agree with me or not, I'm telling you, nobody's come to help you in anything. And Hashem is proving it to you in the last year, showing you nobody's coming to your aid. Start taking care of yourself. He started showing it to us in Corona. Don't count on the government. Don't count on the Kupat Cholim. Don't count on the hospital. Don't count on anything. Remember? Oh, you already forgot. Only four years. Corona, the first slap to the face, Hashem was telling us, Al tivtach ba'adam. Aru hagever shivtach ba'adam. Okay? That's Pasuk from Tehilim. Dam is the person who trusts any human. That's the first lesson Corona was. You start taking care of yourself. Now, throughout the years, Hashem is telling us, you, uh, you, um, I took off the helping wheels. How do you call it? Helping wheels? Training, Training wheels? wheels? And I'm not holding you anymore. I teach my kids how to ride a bike. That's the trick. We take the turn, training wheels off. I pretend I'm holding the bike. They keep looking that I'm holding. I'm not even holding. But if you want to do justice with your kids or students or anyone, you don't uh, 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 do things for them. You make them do things for themselves. That's what I do with my kids. I teach my kids, do things for yourselves. Abba, help me with this. I'll help you and, and teach you once. Next time you do it. And they might think I'm a bad father. I know I'm a good father. I'm teaching them skills. Figure it out. Do it yourself. Don't come to me for, for solutions all the time. You figure it out. Use your brain. And if you don't have it in your brain, go to Google. Go to YouTube. And I'm not joking. Uh, 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 improvise. Learn. Do something. You give this the tools to a child, they'll grow up to be a healthy adult. So I'm trying to give you these tools right now. The message from Hashem is, Mashiach is coming. The redemption is coming. What we're seeing right now is nothing. It's going to become much worse everywhere in the world. If you're looking for a safe place, it's not geographically, it's under Hashem. Wherever you stand under Hashem, nothing will happen to you. Unless Hashem wants something to happen, chas v'shalom. But if you are aligned with Hashem, Hashem says, I'll protect you. What you need to focus on from this entire talk, you have to be very careful from the movement of Balak that is trying to awaken all the time the golden calf in you. This draw to quick solutions. By the way, that's the golden calf. We're constantly looking for quick uh, solutions and quick answers. Human nature, I don't want to do the long way. Give me the short way. You cannot do that when serving with Hashem. There's no shortcuts serving Hashem. Humanity is trying to find shortcuts to serve Hashem. And I'm saying humanity because it's in all the faiths. There's no shortcuts with serving Hashem. So now Hashem is telling us that straight out. You're on your own. Here's the tools. Do it yourself. When I share with you this story with me stealing the car, you know how proud I was of myself, not in a negative way, it motivated me. I'm talking when I got my license by myself. It was the first time that I didn't ask money from anyone. I went and worked for my own money. You know how I, how I was proud of myself? You know, how it, it, it changed my perspective of anything. It literally, it's like I felt I, I uh, opened my wings and I was like, hey, I can fly. Uh, you know, it sounds funny. That was the changing point in my life. When I was 17, I was like, wait a minute. I can do whatever I want. Now, I took it to the wrong place when I said I can do whatever I want. That didn't work well. Because Hashem told me you can't do whatever you want. But in the concept, I got the idea that I, could, I can do whatever I, I put as a goal. That's what I'm trying to give to you. You can do whatever you want. 
You can do whatever Hashem wants you to do. I'm telling you now, you're running now 2% of your abilities. And uh, 50% of it is being distracted with your Yetzirah throwing to you distractions all day long. Bills, kids, money, issues, health, food, landlord. So you're distracted, you're not focused on what you need to do. But the rest, you just don't know how to unleash your power. Because nobody ever told you that you have this power and you can do it yourself. So now Shem is coming and telling you, not only that you can do it yourself, you are going to do it yourself. So figure it out and get with the program. And what one needs to do now, I told you, to summarize to, tonight prayers, Yudzayin Tammuz is the turning point. You go from Yudzayin Tammuz to Tisha B'Av with the right attitude. By Tisha B'Av, everything flips. I will teach that in the next class. What are we going to do for Tisha B'Av? Right now, what you need to focus on is that from tonight, you must take on yourself, first of all, to acknowledge everything that I said here. One by one, make yourself lists. Where am I failing? Where am I not trusting Hashem? Where am I judging other people? Go listen to the class again. I have my own notes. I don't need to see the class. I wrote the notes. But you think I'm teaching you what I don't teach myself? I'm giving you now a rule in alone another that you know if you follow me and, teach and learn from me. I will never teach you something that I don't do myself. Anything that I teach is after I did it that I can come and say it worked or it's right or I looked or I searched. If I come and read for you something, one line, you know I read you one line from the Zohar. I read I think maybe 40 pages in the Zohar combined in different places so I can 100% be sure that I'm not misleading you or misguiding you. And what I read, it's on the money. Come and now argue with me. So I, um, uh, uh, my policy, it has to be bulletproof. I'm not going to come and teach you something that, I'm, uh, that you'll come in later and tell me it's not true. I never saw it. What's the source? So, and more than that, the advice that I gave you is because I did it myself. And I'm still doing it myself. So from tonight, you need to take on yourself a, everything that I just told you. Clean your camp, focus on everything you need to do. Do your calculations, what you're missing, what you're not doing, what you need to become stronger, what you need to do, where you need to do tshuva. Don't leave loose ends. It's not time to leave loose ends. I did that tshuva 20 years ago when I became observant. 10 years of intense tshuva. I now teaching and guiding somebody with tshuva and I told, he also did a lot of bad business and I told him, you owe that money to people. You have to locate these people and give them the money. He looked at me like I'm, like I'm a, I don't know what. I told him that's the look I had 20 years ago when my rabbi told me to do that. But you have to do it. You have to turn rocks. You have to find who you owe money. Especially if you know. If you don't know, that's a different method. So tshuva here is a must. But to add on that, the final conclusion, ask yourself, and after you answer yourself, from tomorrow you take on yourself whatever you can to increase in learning Torah. I just told you now, the learning Torah, that's the key. Of course, no slander, no cheat, no lying, do charity, chesed, everything is great. If we will have now an increase of Torah in the world, if every person now will double the Torah they do, we have double the Torah in the world. Now, if Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai's son, Rabbi Elazar says, one mitzvah, you tilt the whole world, the kav schut, isn't it a so much more so on learning Torah? So my humble suggestion to you, and I'm not going to explain now because we're running out of time. From tonight, Tonight you do the Yud Zion prayer that you can find on my website. It's just a few tilim. But from Yud Zion and Tammuz, you take on yourself, you take on yourself whatever you want. My recommendation, if you're not doing it already, that you read every day Tikkun HaGadol, not Tikkun HaKali, Tikkun HaGadol from the Shala HaKadosh. If you want to do the minimum from here till, 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 till Tisha B'Av, the three weeks. But if you're smart, and you agree with everything that I said right now, then you do it indefinite. And why is that important to do something like, listen, if you have the ability, and you have the knowledge, and you have the language, and you can learn Gemara, Halakha, like learn Torah, that's the learning Torah. 
Watching a video, it's not really learning Torah. It's being educated. Learning Torah is that the page, the book is here, and you read it, and you ask yourself 50 times questions because you didn't understand it. You don't run to the rabbi. When you come and listen to my classes, after I digested the material a whole month, after me going through all the commentaries, and which commentary said what, and, and I'm happy to do that. But when you're sitting here, you're being uh, spoon-fed. That's, uh, in my understanding, that's not learning Torah. You're being educated. Oh, no, don't get me wrong, it's a Torah class. And you have a schar, you have a reward for Torah. But if you compare these three hours to a person learning Gemara one hour, that's a person, that's a whole different Torah. You need to have that. And I know many will tell you, oh, women don't need to learn Torah. Your prayers and your mouth is so much more powerful than men, then please learn Torah. And you don't need to learn Gemara, you don't need to learn Zohar, read Tilim. Read Tilim from morning to night. That's our power. When push comes to shove, when Hashem is going to do the ta-da, and it's not going to look good, trust me, I mean, what's going to happen then? Let me tell you what's going to happen into the future. When Hashem is going to do ta-da, and the ones who don't know what ta-da means, like, here it is, that's going to be the day when we're going to wake up to a new reality. Now, you know what's going to happen? I'll predict to you what's going to happen. Half will not survive. And the ones who will survive, the level of tshuva that is going to be required for them to do, that's what Hashem wants. Now, we need to get to that without that day. Because Hashem wants us to do real tshuva. Now, you need to think, how am I doing this tshuva without Hashem bending my hand or without the whole world collapsing? And uh, the world still might collapse, but you will be strong by not being affected by that. So the learning of the Torah is essential for every individual. And that's why I think the easiest way to keep it consistent is a compilation of Tehillim. That's, that's the easiest. If you ask me, learn Halacha, learn Gemara, learn Zohar. Learn whatever you can from a book. If you can't, if you can, still read that. Now, if you have the, 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 the seder, I don't know if to call it a custom, to read and you read every day tikkun klali or whatever, good, you should. If you don't have one like that, that you do every day religiously, then that's a problem. Because you need something that is done kavua. There's another class that I'm preparing, it's not going to go another time, where unbelievable information, uh, unbelievable information, but the message is so simple. If you know how to break your, your uh, desire, and you know how to control your desire, that's it, you, you won the game. It's, only about, it's all, all about knowing how to bring yourself to control your desire. When you know how to control your desire, that's what the Mishnah says. About, about who's the, uh, how, how this translation, uh, who is the, Ezra Gibor, sorry, I, I can't think of it in English, I have to say it in Hebrew. Ezra Gibor, Hakoveshet Yitzor. Who is a Gibor? A Gibor is like a hero, uh, a brave individual, strong. Who is that person? That is only that he knows to conquer his yetzel, his desire. I can tell you that in my path of tshuva, I see that the most important thing is to know how to control yourself. If I need to make some type of a evaluation or to some type of put it in a visual, from all the efforts I do as a Torah observant individual, the most important that I see has most value is on knowing, knowing to control yourself. Controlling your anger, controlling your sadness, controlling your thoughts, don't be judgmental, controlling your mouth, controlling, control. You know how to control yourself, you're, you have, you're on top of the game. And it's just uh, maneuvering. It's like, uh, you know, you playing ping pong, but in front of you are five people, not one. So you're not going like, pick, pick. you're like, tick, 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 tick. But you, you have the system, that's why they made it in the matrix, that when Neo stopped all the bullets, then the agent came and started hitting him, and he went, he saw it slowly, remember? He moved his hand slowly, so he understands how he's blocking, and then he started going, like, fast. 
First get the idea, then go fast with it. I hope that the words of the Torah were able to penetrate the audience. It, I can tell you that uh, the preparing this class affected me, changed things in me. It took me a long time to prepare the class. I, the dots are very far away. I hope it was clear enough that you put everything together. I jumped from topic to topic. But everything is to conclude in one thing. What are you doing? That's my conclusion for this class. How are you leaving this class tonight? What are you doing tonight? If you didn't change anything, you lost. If you're coming out of this class tonight and you have a plan, you take a piece of paper and you start writing yourself, okay, from today I'm doing this. These are my downfalls. These are my good qualities. Here I fail. This is hard for me. This is easy for me. That's how I do all day long. If I see that I fail in something, I analyze it. I reverse engineer. What's going on? Why am I failing here? Why is it so hard for me? Shem is going to give you all the, all the answers you need. But they make sure that besides it, you make a huge switch in your mind of how you're seeing things is a call to action. What are you doing? If you're not doing anything, you're missing the point. You're going to wake up one day and say, why didn't I do anything? And you see how the time is being pulled out uh, uh, under our legs. Be, uh, we're standing and the time is just pulled. It's not normal. You know that it's Rosh Hashanah in two months? Rosh Hashanah is in two months. We just celebrated Rosh I can't believe it. I, 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 I can't just, I just, there's no words. And you all smile, you don't understand. The time is like, what the hell is going on? Sunday, Shabbat, Shabbat, Friday, what? Everything. And it's going to become faster and faster. Because towards the end, Hashem is pulling it faster. Therefore, the smart person that sat for three hours and listened, take another five minutes and say, okay, what's my plan? What is my plan? What are the good things that I'm doing? Check. What are the good things that I need to do? List. What are the bad things that I'm doing? Remove. What are the bad things I need to be careful? This. Who do I need to make amends with? How much Torah am I learning a day? Am I doing what I'm supposed to do? And all with a smile. Not uh, OCD. <laughs> but it's hard to be now not OCD. There's a lot of spiritual pressure. A lot of spiritual pressure. It's not you that's feeling it. It's everybody. You're not the only one who's feeling the spiritual pressure that you don't know what, how to, to, to digest it. It's everybody. And it's going to become worse. Therefore, let's take the advice of the Torah. Let's stand strong, believing in the Kadosh Baruch That's the test. The test, Hashem, they understand that Hashem is testing you day and night, left and right, 24-7. Why? Because there's no more time. And Hashem wants to give you the medal, the trophy, the kiss. By telling you, you did it. You did it yourself. You didn't need nobody to push you. You didn't need nobody to scare you. You didn't need that. You did it yourself. So I wish you all to do it yourself. And I wish you all that Hashem will guide you in the right path, that you will reach to your true potential, that you should reach to your true power to fulfill your potential, that you should become an acting, an active person in hasting the Geula, understanding this, this, what's going on, and acting accordingly. Have a, an easy and meaningful fast. Meaningful means that you can make a change. If you didn't make a change after the fast, it wasn't meaningful, you just starved yourself. It didn't do anything. If you leave the fast with a change, and you know what the change is? You can choose whatever change you want. I choose simple things. Take on yourself that from Yudzayin Betamuz you are reading every day Tikkun Gadol or Tikkun Klali or five chapters of Tilim that you chose. But consistent every day. You don't miss it. You don't miss it. When you do something consistent, even if it's this big, that's how you break the Klippa. That's how you show Hashem your diligence. That's how you show Hashem I'm, I'm, I'm not giving up. It's hard for me. I have a lot of challenges. I'm not giving up. But in regards to the fight with the Yetzirah that's trying to pull you constantly back, what I told you, to heresy, don't believe in Hashem, don't trust in Hashem, the Yetzirah is not going to come and tell you, oh, believe in Jesus, don't believe in Hashem. The Yetzirah is not going to tell you that. 
The Yetzirah is going to tell you, oh, you're very sick. You have to go to that doctor, that doctor, that doctor, and take this turn. That's what the Yetzirah is going to tell you. Oh, he's going to tell you, oh, you don't have money. You got to go do it. You got to go borrow money. You got to do it. The Yetzirah is going to give you the worst advice. Stick to Hashem. Attach yourself to Hashem. Take on yourself, on your Zion, Metamuz, a strong decision of learning Torah, something you can do. Even if it's one chapter of Tilim with three lines, it doesn't matter. The more, of course, the better. When Hashem sees that you are standing firm and you're not moving backwards from any distraction, from your decision, He will make it fruitful. He will bless you from that. I'm telling you, I have a challenge that I love learning a lot of Torah, but my day doesn't allow me to learn a lot of Torah lately. I don't have enough time to learn Torah. And it bothers me. And I question, I don't question Hashem, I question, I ask a question, Hashem, you know that if you, wouldn't, if you would remove this and this and these challenges right now, you know how much more Torah I would learn? Don't you want me to learn Torah? When I learn Torah, I teach it. So Hashem, if... I would hear the answer. I'm, I'm, I mean, I talk to Hashem. I know what He's answering me. Hashem is answering me, I don't need your Torah or your teaching of your Torah. You are nothing. Learning Torah? I have Rabbi Meir in Shemaim. I have Rabbi Akiva. That's learning Torah. You pretending you're learning Torah. I have enough teachers in learning Torah in Shemaim. I need you finding your inclination and ba bouncing your challenges. And as you're bouncing the challenges, that's when you squeeze in the 10 minutes of your Torah. And that's my message. Yeah, you're going to be challenged and you're going to be, uh, what's the word? Dizzy from challenges. You are already. I'm not making anything new. Now Shem says, find the moments where you stop, you pray, you say Birkat Amazon when you eat. I know you don't feel like saying Birkat Amazon right now, but you ate bread. Achalta, Savata. Berachta, you ate, you fulfilled, breast. The name of the game here is consistent and not to be affected by the challenges to do what you're supposed to do. Define, like I told you, definitions. Define what is your purpose, what you need to do. Even if you don't know what your purpose is, define. In the next month, my definition is to do tshuva. Make a definition. Now, what do you do that everything is around it? If my day is involving taking care of kids, taking care of my wife, fi uh, financing, uh, uh, um, uh, fin I mean, uh, living, I need to make a living, running an organization, teaching, to I mean, I have a lot of things to do, but the center is Hashem. First is Hashem, everything is around. So what is more important to me right now, to do something that I'm dedicated and I have to do to Hashem, or something that is part of my challenges? And the trick is when i dealing with a challenge, or an obstacle, or something, and I let it go completely, and I deal with what I need to deal with Hashem that moment, somehow the challenge gets taken care of. I don't know, that's how it always works for me. Exam one, example out of many, and then we'll leave. Not too long ago, I had to deal with something urgent, 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 urgent. Okay? I'm flying next week to America. I'm going on a two-month tour. Two months, I'm not going to be here. I'm going... West, East, North, South, all over the United States. Over 40 lectures, it's going to be a very interesting summer. So, uh, I needed something urgently to be shipped and to be dealt with. And technically, it could have been done in three minutes over a phone call. That's my prayer. Hashem, make things go smooth. Three days we had to deal paperwork and not paperwork and send here. And this guy doesn't answer Three days of dealing with something that should take 30 seconds. And it was so urgent and, and I had a choice. I had to run to pray Mincha or deal with it. And now I'm standing in a crossroad. If I don't deal with it, the shipment won't go out. This won't go. It, it, it will be a big problem. But I owe Hashem Mincha. Now, if I deal now with the shipping and everything... Will that help me in any type of way with my prayers? No. If I go and pray, would that help me in any type of way with the shipping? Yes. So, the, 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 the answer is simple. Go and pray. 
Do what you're supposed to do. Do your obligation. And tell Hashem, I did my obligation. Can you solve my shipping problem? That's it. That's how it works. But the Yetzirah is always going to come, like I just told you, the golden calf, raise the fumes of idolatry, which means I don't think Hashem can solve the problem. I need to solve the problem. That's idolatry. That's heresy. In my mind, I need to be now on the call with China, with America, with the shipping company, this, everything. If it's not cheap, it's not going to come on time. It's going to make, not going to make it to the lecture. What are we going to do? I don't know. It's something minute. But it's not. It's, it's talking here about big things. But the right attitude, dealing with this, is not going to help me on the spiritual side. But going to the spiritual side and praying and doing what I'm supposed to do, it can only help. And if chas v'shalom, and here's, a, here's a, 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 a tricky challenge. I'm telling you a live scenario. Now what will happen if I would go and pray, come back, and it would become worse? Then would be uh, a test. Hashem, why are you doing this? I went and prayed. Why are you do Heresy. Why questioning Hashem? It was supposed to happen either way, praying or not praying. Ah, you think because you went to pray? It didn't happen or happened. That's the nonsense that's going on in people's mind. And then when you question Hashem, hey, Hashem, I went to pray Mincha. I left everything to pray Mincha for you. You couldn't make it happen. Why are you screaming at Hashem? Maybe it wasn't supposed to happen to start. And for that, you're questioning Hashem. Questioning Hashem is a nice way of saying it. It's heresy. Because you don't believe that Hashem is in control. He can do whatever he can or want. You're putting now Hashem aside. You understand what I'm, where I'm going with it? That's the name of the game. Now, top on that, learning Torah. Learning Torah, you'll have the biggest Yetzirah. When you come to learn Torah, when you come to do any mitzvah, the Yetzirah is going to do whatever he can to stop you. You know that. The more important is what you need to do, the more the Yetzirah is going to stop, try to stop uh, you doing it. <clears throat> so if the Yetzirah is working over time, then you know, that's what I'm supposed to do. Now, if I fail with the Yetzirah, again, I'm caving in that the Kadosh Baruch Hu is secondary. So the Yetzirah, I believe that the biggest Yetzirah, when you're coming to do a certain uh, act, action, then the Yetzirah is going to bother you. If it's a very important thing that you need to do, the Yetzirah is going to bother you even more. So just imagine how much the Yetzirah is going to bother you when you come to learn Torah because the Yetzirah knows how powerful it is. So that's why I'm saying take something small that it takes you 10 minutes to read that you can consistent to do it. That's how you're going to win. That's how we're going to change what the prophecy says that the days of fast will turn to days of joy and happiness. Mezad Hashem, from here we're going to Tu Be'av, days of Simcha. And we can change everything for the good. The destination of where the world is going, that we can change. But the path, how it's going to go, we have a big effect. And we have a responsibility as Jews and as human beings to better the world with our Torah, with our mitzvot. And don't think that your Torah is not worth anything. So I wish you again an uh, easy, meaningful fast. Please take everything to consideration. Share the video, share the information, apply the information, pray the Yudzayim B'Tamuz prayers. Mezad Hashem, Mashiach can still come tonight and the fast will be cancelled and we'll go to uh, Bet HaMikdash with Mashiach Tzidkenu and finally see the coming of Hashem and uh, Mezad Hashem should have a safe safe and quiet summer and hopefully the redemption should come as easy as possible Bechesed Barachamim but instead of hoping let's do some acts of kindness and acts of Torah and good things and by default the mercy will start uh, uh, interfering and the redemption can come with a lot of mercy. Bezal Hashem.